All right, so thank you so very much for extending the invitation. Uh, now, I know my mother would probably say it's fate or something because we were planning to actually reach out to the authority because there's an, there's an event that is taking place soon, and I'll talk more about this event shortly. It's a high profile event, uh, it's to do with um, higher education institutions. But anyway, so my name is Lighton Piri. Um, I'm currently a lecturer and researcher at the University of Zambia. Um, and perhaps I should make mention of the fact that uh, uh, as of 2019, I was actually appointed as, um, what happened there? I was appointed as um, uh, technical advisor for Invest of Zambia Online Journals. So ideally my role in that capacity is to, uh, to help out for any technical specific issues to do with the online journal platform that the OOMS are launched uh, in 2019. Um, I think there should be screenshots of the online journal platform, but you can get through to it by going to journals.unza.z <coughs> um, and more on that shortly. Uh, so what I did was, uh, when I was talking to Dr. Mfune, I had asked uh, what the focus of the presentation should be, and, and as he mentioned earlier, he told me to just leave it open-ended. Uh, feel free to interrupt me as I'm presenting this. Um, we can have a back and forth. We don't have to wait until the end because I think I, I have quite a bit to talk about. Okay. All right. So I, I, I thought the interaction would, would take this format. Um, I'll do I'll do a bit of advertising. I always do that uh, at the beginning of my talks, and then we shall um, we shall get into the nitty gritties of uh, online journal platforms. Um, so I'll just. Uh, mentioning that there's this high profile event that's taking place. It, it turns out that I sit on the um, board of directors for what's called the Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertations, the NDOTD. Um, you can find out more about uh, the NDOTD organization itself by going to ndotd.org. Um, <coughs> we haven't yet gotten confirmation, but, but we know that this is happening. So the 27th uh, International Symposium on Electronic Thesis and Dissertation is actually going to be taking place in Zambia. Uh, and in fact, this is the, the second time the event is, is <coughs> being hosted on the African continent. I know when I was a graduate student in 2011, I, I attended the symposium which was uh, hosted by the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, uh, I don't know exactly who we are going to have to talk to um, about the event itself, but, but, but ideally the the, the symposium itself is focused on trying to, uh, how best to try and increase the online visibility of a specific uh, scholarly output that is produced by higher education institutions, electronic thesis and dissertation manuscripts. So these things that uh, master's students and PhD students who produce in, in, in institutions that uh, conduct research, or at least institutions that offer uh, postgraduate programs that will uh, as part of the partial fulfillment of the program, students will be expected to produce a manuscript. I'm mentioning this because I know that for our institution, for instance, we have three types of masters, right? There's what they call mode A, B, and C, and mod, mod A is taught only, so students don't produce any dissertation. But the taught and dissertation, for instance, that Mr. Kawishi is pursuing, requires that uh, in the second phase, um, he starts working on a dissertation and then a final product with a manuscript. Uh, so the research for this symposium is in and around electronic thesis and dissertation. There's, there's actually quite a lot of interesting work that has been done. What you'll probably notice um, is that um, in the recent past, there's been a strong focus on trying to, so research, the researchers are trying to think about how we can increase the online visibility of ETDs from um, the global south. So places like... Um, Africa, for instance. It's, it's actually bad. Um, I have um, a few screenshots that I'm going to showcase. If you look at, uh, so there's, there's this service. It's an aggregate service that is overseen by the NDOTD. And what they do is they collect dissertations from higher education institutions across the world. If you look at the representation from the African continent, it's almost zero, right? Um, so anyways, we are thinking that uh, perhaps hosting the event in Zambia will ensure that our, is it 60, I've lost count now, is it 67 higher education institutions uh, who ask, uh, actually start thinking about setting up repositories to make available these uh, thesis and dissertations online, okay? 
Um, I'm happy to share the, the bid, the document that we submitted to the NDOTD. Um, and, and like I said, it would be nice if, I, if we knew exactly who to contact from the authority so that we can already start uh, planning for this event. This is tentatively going to be held in October of next year. Um, and again, if you go to that link, you have a sense of uh, where this event has been held in the last uh, couple of years. So the very first symposium was held in 1998, um, and the symposium is held every year, like I said. Last year it was held in, uh, in Serbia. This year it's going to be in India. Um, and next year, obviously, it's, it's going to be hosted by the University of Zambia. Uh, it will be held uh, right here in Zambia. Um, if you want to find out more details about uh, the NDOTD as an entity, you can go to ndotd.org. Um, there's interesting details about membership. I imagine an entity like HEA would want to be a member. Um, details of the benefits that you get by being a member are clearly outlined there. Uh, but also you have uh, access to, there's an ETD journal there, you also have access to past proceedings from uh, <coughs> Uh, past symposia that have been conducted since 1998. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the NDOTD um, also administers two crucial services. So there's what they call the union catalog. So if you go to union.ndotd.org slash portal, um, you will have access to um, details of electronic thesis and metadata harvested. So these are statistics of ETD metadata harvested from universities across the world. Uh, I, I cut off the thing here, but if, if, I, if I was to go to uh, union.ndotd.org, you have a sense of uh, the, list of, the list of these institutions that from where metadata is harvested. Sadly, uh, uh, we, we don't have any Zambian institution listed here. <laughs> but uh, but these, are, these are things, I'll talk more about this. These are things that uh, Myself, along with uh, brilliant students, have been working with uh, trying to think about. In fact, we are working towards setting up a national ETD portal that is meant to harvest ETDs from uh, higher education institutions in Zambia. Okay. Uh, if you go to OATD, and I don't have a screenshot of OATD, they have a very nice visualization that um, I, th I think one of the vis visualizations shows you a breakdown of ETDs from different parts of the world, you know, different continents and countries actually. So if you go to oatd.org um, and uh, perhaps you go to, I don't know if I can find where the visualization part here, or perhaps this thing is still loading, um, you should be able to, unless if they stop offering this service here, data visualization, if I go to data visualization there, you notice that uh, very, very soon it will pop up. There's a very nice, uh, I guess we can go to country of publication. There's, there's a very nice visual representation, it's a tree chart. I like, I quite like the tree chart here. That shows you a breakdown of ETDs. So um, I'm sure people are familiar with how a tree chart looks like. It's showing you the, the relative number of ETDs coming from different parts of the world. So by continent, so these countries here are from Europe. Um, the middle part here is North America. And then you have South America, and if we scroll down at the bottom here, you find that uh, Africa is in the bottom right quadrant here, this corner here, showcasing to us that uh, most of this content is largely coming from South Africa. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's a very nice visualization to, to look at, uh, very nice visual representation to look at. And I, and I think that the, the only, we know that, if you look at Zambia, for instance, we know that uh, there are certain entities that actually have students that produce manuscripts, UNILAS, right? CBU, UNSA. Um, we expect Zambia to, to be highly represented there. But anyway, uh, they also offer a search service. So if you go to search.ndotd.org, um, people that are interested in searching for research done by students, uh, postgraduate students around the world, can actually search for metadata. Um, and interestingly enough, this is powered by this, uh, this, this service here. I left out the details of um, the technologies that uh, enable this to actually take place, but if people are interested, you want to look up uh, what's called the uh, OAI PMH protocol for metadata harvesting. Um, so that's that about the symposium. I, I do hope we can work together and, uh, and in fact, even co-host this, right? We can target as it being co-hosted by the HEA and the Invest of Zambia because of the crucial role that you play in this space. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, they provide funding for the event, so I don't think we would have to worry about uh, would worry, worry so much about uh, uh, where the money is going to come from. Um, and then more advertising. So I'm co-founder of uh, a research group at the University of Zambia we call the Data Lab Research Group. And what we do is we primarily conduct research in three main areas. So in an area called digital library, which is linked to what we're discussing here today. Um, but we also do extensive research in a field of study called data mining. Um, and our focus is largely on um, uh, a field of computing called artificial intelligence. We do a lot of uh, supervised machine learning, actually. Um, if you go to our website, you will find details of publications that uh, our students and colleagues have authored or co-authored. Um, you want to poke around in the event that you want us to collaborate on some of uh, the works that we've, we've done. Um, we also conduct uh, research in a subfield of computing called educational technology. So we are largely interested in finding out how best we can make education effective or educators more effective. Yes. Was, uh, was your question answered? The one where you were saying, uh, who to write? Yes. No, 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 it was not. Just to the director general. Okay. Yes, it, it, it will trickle down. The communication comes through. Wonderful. Office. Yeah. So now we have the acting director general. So write, just write to his office and then yes. it, will, it, will, it will follow through. Wonderful. I will do just that, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the, the research group uh, loosely comprises really of. Um, researchers and, and, and students that are supervised by uh, academic members of staff. Uh, currently, the academic members of staff, aside from myself, uh, colleagues from the investigation hospitals because we are collaborating on this um, long-term project. It's to do with medical imaging. Um, and so most of our, our academic members of staff are actually from there. These are uh, radiologists um, by profession. Um, and then the students are either supervised or co-supervised by the academic members of staff. Of course, there are some academic members of staff that are not listed here, uh, like our colleague from the University of Cape Town and another colleague from UTH, for instance, or two colleagues from UTH, actually. Um, in terms of specific things that we've done relative to what we're discussing today, I just cherry-picked some publications here. Uh, when I first joined the UNSA, this was the, I think, the easiest thing I could do, low-cost research, very little funding required here. Um, and also because of my background, because my master's was actually focused on um, proposing simple architectures for developing systems that are used, software systems that are used to store, manage, and enable access to research, research outputs, output. so, so journal articles, articles uh, ETDs, and all those things. Those things. So when I joined the UNSA late 2017, 2028, uh, started poking around uh, this um, problem that, that we have in Zambia, Zambia right? The, the fact, fact that we, if you look at the online visibility of research output in Zambia, it's quite low, extremely low. Um, UNSA is trying, but even if you look at what UNSA does, it's, it's actually depressing, right? If you look at the, the things that we can find online relative to the total number of academic staff at UNSA, I mean, it's, it's, it's the two are diametrically opposed, right? But we know what the problem is. You know, people publish. Of course, this problem is more facilitated, but we know that people publish. It's just that the issue is uh, there are no deliberate mechanisms in place to make sure that this content is actually available online. Uh, what's forcing the owners to actually improve, by the way, is um, uh, the modification to the proportion criteria. I don't know if people are aware, but uh, as of uh, is it 2019 or something, the promotion criteria includes an aspect where they will look at um, the impact that your research has. So the impact, obviously, is measured using a metric called the H-index. And what the H-index does, at least as, uh, how the UNSA does it, is it requires that your research is online and decided. And, and so in the last two years, we've seen an increasing number of researchers actually putting their research online. Um, so an easy-to-read paper. This was 2018. Um, we're interested in just uh, mapping out the landscape in terms of online visibility of research quite low. One of the conclusions here was that uh, visibility is very, very low. Um, relative to research visibility and increasing the profile of researchers in Zambia, we, we, we do a lot of machine learning, so trying to figure out exactly how we can take advantage of AI techniques uh, to address this problem. Um, 
I again picked out some sample publications that are relevant to uh, issues to do with AI and machine learning. There are sections in some of these publications that are quite easy to follow. Uh, I know Mr. Kawashi would, be, would easily follow through with these things because I, I know his dissertation is linked to machine learning. Um, and then there are more specific things that are um, I linked to what, what is happening at the UNSA, right? Uh, so this publication con to do with controlled vocabularies in digital libraries is centered around the fact that if, if you look at the UNSA repository, um, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to actually go to the UNSA repository here. If we go to the UNSA repository, right, and, uh, and I'll use uh, Dr. Mfune's former uh, school here as an example. If you go to the UNSA, what, what an institutional repository is used for is it's used to make a very scholarly research output. So the things that academic members of staff do by way of research will result in some publication, conference papers, you know, journal articles, book chapters, books, technical reports, doesn't matter, right? All of those things are ideally supposed to be placed on an institutional repository. I guess you're wondering why this is important. Well, it plays into the rankings, right? Because <coughs> these ranking entities will look at the things that are available online by your institution. Um, but if we go to, if, if we just look at the content coming in from the different schools, but were, when you see education here, what they're saying is that there are currently in the repository a total of 495 publications linked to academic members of staff uh, in the School of Education at the UNSA. Hey, I mean, we have 130 plus academic members of staff in the School of Education. And uh, as School of Education is better off, right? Um, if you look at schools like Agricultural Sciences, for instance, there is no way we would sit here and say, since the UNSA uh, started operating, we only have 68 publications from academic members of staff. No, we know this is not true. We're still for uh, schools like engineering. But long story short is um, we obsess a lot about how we can make sure that the content that needs to go in here actually goes in there. And, and there are a number of things we are doing. Um, we are under-resourced, but most of this work is done by master's students, and it takes a while before they can actually uh, act on some of these things. And sadly, very little of what we do actually goes into production. Most of these will just end up uh, in some student's dissertation, manuscript, or thesis, or something. Um, currently, I'm working with a student who is uh, going to be presenting something. I'll extend an invitation to everybody in here, uh, in case you're interested. She's been doing an analysis. Um, to try and understand why it is that, if you look at a typical researcher like Dr. Mfune, if we look at his Google Scholar profile, what you will find is that his Google Scholar profile will have more or less everything he's published. But if we go in, if we were to go in uh, the School of Natural Sciences, right, which has 29 publications, if we were to just check for Dr. Mfune here, we find that there's little or nothing here. Now, I, I know the, the argument that most researchers will make is, or we can check, right? <laughs> the argument that most researchers will make is that, uh, well, I have my content online, and that's fine, right? As an individual entity, as an individual, yes, people know what you're doing, but when they look at where you're coming from, people look at what your institution does, right? Um, anyway, let's see if we can check for Google uh, Scholar. We can check Google Scholar as well. Yeah, and then I, I think maybe the... Just to say the challenge is, uh, that's why I'm thinking that the library should have been doing more. Yes. Um, because if I go to my Google Scholar profile, yes. um, I'll s definitely I see that Google has compiled all my works. Eh? Yes. Um, and I can find them online. Yeah. Um, but um, the same is not linked to the repository. Yeah. Well, yeah. that, this was my... <laughs> so the dissertation? No, this was my undergraduate research project. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is interesting. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, but by the way, this is one of the problems we have. Uh, yeah. The, the thing about what's happening at the UNSA is, um, and this ties into what we're discussing about the online journal platform, capacity is very important, right? People take it for granted that you set up the system and everything will work in autopilot. No, right? If you notice, the California is telling us that this is his undergraduate uh, report, but he did not do this in 2015, we know this, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why there's 
there's a huge backlog, if you look at the ones, there's a huge backlog of things that are supposed to be in the repository that are not in the repository. And we've discovered, we've done studies, and we've discovered that the ones are currently, the library only employs two people that are responsible for uploading content in the repository. So if I publish something and I don't take advantage of self-archiving, I go to the library and I tell the library, oh, upload this content for me. So those two people. When students are graduating, ideally all of those manuscripts are supposed to go online. Those things are given to those two people. Now, if you sit down and understand how this is done, the workflow involved in uploading this, it's quite lengthy. It can take as long as 30 minutes to upload a single item. So it's a reason why there's a huge backlog. Um, but, but of course, I mean, what's sustainable in the long run is you want people to be able to self-deposit. Just like when you launch your journal, submission, traditionally what journals will do is maybe you email your manuscript to somebody, but when you set up an online platform, uh, potential authors will register for an account, log in, and upload. They'll self-archive. It's called self-archiving. You're uploading on your own. So it's one of the easiest ways of addressing this problem we know is self-archiving, but that requires a bit of training and... Uh, um, I guess making people understand the importance of this, right? Uh, for the average researcher, hey, as long as I publish and uh, my H index is fine, why should I worry about the repository, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, but but you notice here if you compare, you know, uh, Dr. Mfune's, you know, Google Scholar results from what we have in the repository, it's very few. If you look at the results, we have only is is it? Uh, I don't know how many items we have here. It doesn't show the items, but sadly, I think. Some, some of the hits here are coming from people that perhaps Dr. Yeah, Mfune so has supervised. So these are my students. Yes. For me, it's just that same, that yeah. same one there that I did my undergraduate. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's in the repository. Yeah. But, but I think uh, maybe Uza should do more because uh, already, for example, my master's dissertation is not, He's not there, the right. PhD, but it's in the repository of the other university. Yeah. And my journal articles also are not in that repository. Right. So maybe there should be more weight than yes. Mm -hmm. So for, for for some of us who submitted our manuscripts in 2017, it can't even appear. There. It probably does appear. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, what should you search for? Uh, no, okay. no, your master should appear. Why? What should we search for? Your last name? Just in Denis so Denis Denis like that? Yes. So there's uh, there's a couple of hits here. Uh, this oh, this bright in Sokolo here. Um, this one, so it's that, yeah, it's that. Um, anyway, so so the other thing, right, is is uh, people. Always, well, but the rankings. If you look at how rankings are done, right, times higher education. In fact, uh, I can sit here and uh, make an educated guess. I don't think studies have been done. The reason why we see UNSA's ranking steadily improving is we are going online, right, and we've been quite aggressive about this. So how can I have all of this in the repository? So the, 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 the easiest thing to do is you, you, you can register for an account. Mm -hmm. You go to the UNSA repository. Mm -hmm. It's called self-archiving. Um, when you click on login, there's an option for you to register an account. Oh. And then you can upload the content yourself. Okay. Or you can compile and uh, email the library and say, please upload, but oh. backlog here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but we can sit here and brag to say, in as much as we are struggling as the UNSA, uh, I'm working with... Um, Two students, and part of what they've done is they've done an analysis uh, of higher education institutions in Zambia, and we've discovered that of all the higher education institutions, only six of them have uh, functional institutional repositories. But we know that we probably have a lot more institutions that actually offer postgraduate courses that result in these manuscripts. You know, um, I don't know if the higher education authority has a role to play in this, uh, uh, right? In terms of quality assurance and all of those things, very fine, right? that these numbers, they tell us, oh, we've graduated 2,000 students, oh, but where is the output? Where is the proof that this has happened? Anyway, um, th these are some, some of the sample publications. You'll find out more. Uh, here, you'd have to really cherry pick because, like I said, we work in three broad areas here. Um, but there's a list, comprehensive list of publications associated with the data uh, research group. That's, that's that in terms of uh, uh, advertising. If you, you think uh, there's an area we can collaborate on and work together. We're more than happy to do this. Um, uh, I don't know if you're doing extensive monitoring and evaluation, but uh, our research group does a lot of this. We can help with that. Um, we can also, I suppose there's an opportunity for us to collaborate with entities like um, Zamrin, for instance. 
Because the thing is, if you speak to Zamrin, they'll tell you to say, they offer certain free services. Services that would enable entities that don't have institutional repositories to actually go online. But, but I think uh, sometimes uh, these entities need a whip, right? Uh, enforcement has to be there somehow. There has to be an incentive. Say this is one of the requirements, right? Go online or something. Um, but anyway, um, let's maybe continue and talk about why we are here. Uh, the motivation for why we are here, obviously, is I, I think one of the reasons why you are going online is you want to um, increase the odds that people are going to access what you're publishing. But even more importantly, I think it's important for us to look at the impact of the research we conduct. So, so I imagine the, the authority would be interested in seeing what sort of impact will come out of the research that is going to be published um, in the journal once it's set up. Um, I want to start off by telling us that um, in is it 2019, 2020, I was part of the, I'm part of um, a, the university ranking committee and part of our mandate requires that we generate what's called a research report, an annual research report. Now, it's difficult to generate the report, especially the part of the report that requires us to provide statistics about publications because um, we, a lot of our publications are not online. And it turns out that reporting is, is quite poor at the UNSA. Um, so a sample of the report we recently published is a 2018 report. Uh, again, this speaks volumes to the picture that I presented from the repository, right? In 2018, this is what we see, right? Apparently, uh, if you look at the field the publications, I guess number of staff, that's probably what you want to pay particular attention to here. Uh, now we know that the problem is multifaceted. Some researchers will tell you, academic members of staff will tell you, oh, I have no funding, so I can't do research, which is why we have very few publications. Um, but, but I firmly believe that part of the reason why we, we are seeing weird statistics here like uh, uh, I'll use, uh, uh, I guess I can use the School of Education as an example here because some, 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 well let's use uh, engineering, right? Or humanities. Yes. So uh, 69 against 192 staff. Yes. The right. guys spend more time at senior staff. Yes. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> anyways. Uh, so, so, so the idea behind online publishing is you want to make it a lot easier for people to access your content because it turns out that people will, for instance, if you're obsessing about the H-index, people will cite you if they have access to what you've published. But if what you've published is locked away or it's paywalled, um, it'll be hard for them to gain access to this. Whether this idea of uh, paywalled content is tied to decisions that you have to make once you set up the journal, will you require that people pay money for them to access the journal? We will require that uh, authors or potential authors pay um, APC, right? Um, author processing uh, charge for them to have their work published. Or are you going to leave it open, which is what the uh, UNSA has done. So if you look at our uh, online journal platform, if you've done research, you are free as an, uh, a potential author to actually submit content without a charge. If, if you are somebody who is interested in, in trying to gain a sense of what sort of research of course, it's a quote-unquote international journal, so we have authors from outside Zambia. But if you're interested in the sort of research that goes on at, uh, at the UNSA, you go here without paying any money, you'll be able to access and search for whatever content you want. And we have quite a number of journals that have uh, gone online so far. So this journal platform is used to host all, almost all the uh, UNSA journals. Initially, we started out with the journals that are the, responsi the responsibility of the directorate of Research and Graduate Study, right? DRGS, so JABS, you know, JLSS, uh, Jonas, uh, the three, there are three of them, and Jonas. Anyways, um, so we've gone, this is full open access, right? Um, and the obvious advantages, we know that when somebody goes here and they access the content, they're more likely to cite work done by our research. But also I think what's important is to appreciate that most of the research done by Researchers at the UNSA is funded by taxpayers, right? So it's only fair that we leave it open. Um, anyways, um, again, I already spoke about this just to think about the fact that beyond going online, right, setting up an online journal, we must think about these other research outputs. Right? For instance, when a conference takes place, we must think about where these proceedings are going to be archived. It turns out that there are tools that you can set up uh, in the event that perhaps uh, the authority runs 
uh, a conference. I don't know if there's a conference that is. Yeah, we have run several, but we're not archived. Yes. So we can think about, strategically think about uh, yeah. how we can archive um, this conference proceeding. The beauty is there are open source tools that have been tried and tested that are available, and we have faith here in Mr. Kawesh. We know his <laughs> capabilities here. Um, uh, people like him. Setting up these tools is not a problem. I think administering them is a problem. Um, but again, if you, if you think beyond the higher education authority, I think I already mentioned the fact that we have to think about these other higher education institutions. Can we come up with a strategy to force these other higher education institutions in them to actually set up repositories and archive uh, research that they do, right? All right. Um, also, I, I thought, uh, again, this is beyond, uh, you know, electronic journal publishing. I thought I would make mention of the fact that uh, one of the major projects, this has been ongoing work for a very long time now, but we are glad to say that uh, before year's end, I think this will be launched. So we have, we've set up an aggregate uh, service. The idea behind this aggregate service is supposed to act as a national portal that would be used to collect metadata on and about thesis and dissertations produced in higher education institutions in Zambia. So things coming from UNSA, CBU, UNILAS, right, Zika's University. We want to see them here, a central location where people can go and search for them. And it turns out that this idea is not new, you know. When I was a graduate student, I, I, I played a very crucial role in helping uh, develop this uh, piece of software, which is what we're using. So South Africa has a national uh, portal as well. A number of countries have national portals. And the idea behind national portals is, um, I had mentioned that we have services like OATD and the NDOTD Union Catalog. An entity like UNSA will have a repository. The repository will push content to the national ETD portal. This national EDD portal is ideally supposed to push metadata to a continent-wide portal. The continent-wide portal pushes metadata to the global portal, right? Um, but also, I think I think it would be nice to profile research that is done by these different entities. Uh, I guess um, once this is launched, you get access to it by going to netd.ac.zm. Currently, this prototype thing, the screenshot you are seeing, is not really available on the netd.ac.zm domain, but it will be before year's end. Um, yeah, um, and again, I mean, just to remind us that uh, I, I, th I think again beyond uh, what HEA is interested in, insofar as the journey is concerned, I think your interest also is to increase the profile of, of these higher education institutions because I, I imagine one of the things we'd want hopefully soon, is a situation where we have a lot of international students coming to study in these higher education institutions. And people will come because they check for these things, right? I know this is one of the things I was looking at when I was looking for a place where I was going to do my graduate studies, you know, the rankings. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this research visibility plays so much into the rankings. Yeah, it's a bit odd. I'm sure this has changed slightly, um, uh, but that's fine. Um, Again, we are probably going to touch on uh, indexing here, but beyond setting up a journal, there are certain deliberate things that you will need to do. Right? So setting up a journal doesn't automatically mean that the content in the journal is going to be indexed by these academic databases like uh, uh, Google Scholar, for instance. Right? Um, you have to be deliberate about doing that. What you would want is, if somebody searches in Google Scholar, you want content that is being hosted by your journal to actually appear there because the average person does not go to a specific journal, right? You go to Google Scholar and you search for content and the hits that come up are the ones that you, you go to. So if the HEA journal, for instance, is, is indexed properly, people will be able to, to get the hits. And I'm just showcasing, uh, uh, I guess, hits associated with the wounds. In fact, if we were to go to Google Scholar and do a more focused search here to say sites, journals, Dot unza dot zm and I'll blow it out here and do a search. What you'll notice is that uh, there'll be hits coming in from um, journals.unza.zm hopefully very, very soon. Uh, connection is quite slow here, but uh, but so uh, it's important that we, we put in place deliberate mechanisms to make sure that uh, the content is indexed. I know my connection is a bit slow here, but but uh, if you just search, if you do a focus search, if you just go to sites, full colon, journals.unza.zm, um, I'm sure you'll be able to find uh, uh, content coming in from, uh, uh, from uh, that's fine. I don't know if I've run out of, uh, 
get the bundles here, but that's... Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Porsche. Is Hoffman Street? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's important, I think, that we showcase... Uh, is the full colon also part of the password? Oh, uh, the full colon itself? No. Oh, it's no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So you guys already went work together. Uh, so so he was enrolled in a course I was teaching. Uh, oh, okay. That's how I got to meet him. But uh, yeah, but, but but because I um, I also co supervise students in the computer science department. Um, oh. uh, I'm aware of the sort of research he's doing. Uh, in fact, I was attending an event recently uh, that I was also attending myself. I'm sure it will connect eventually, and then we can we can check this. Oh, it's got to W, right? Yeah. yeah. I think I've managed to get through to it. Right. So, so if you notice, all of these, uh, when I do a focus search, because our journal platform is actually configured in such a way that content is is uh, is indexed properly, we see that there are hits via Google Scholar, and this is what we want. Anyway, um, I, I think the. The, the point of this slide is that uh, there are additional things that you will have to do once you set up the journal. You want to plan for these things. Yeah. Um, but there's also this issue of accreditation. And, and by the way, I, I don't know if this is being discussed by the authority, but it's increasingly becoming a hot topic at the UNSA, especially for people that are applying for these most senior positions, associate professor, professor. So this notion that. Uh, it's not sufficient for you to just say I published. It has to be in a publication published in a reputable uh, publication venue, so a reputable journal, a reputable conference. Now, <laughs> we, we can sit here and debate, and people have debated about what is credible, right, and what is not credible here. Um, but the nice way of getting around this is you look at uh, accreditation. So it turns out that uh, you can accredit your journal by making it possible that your journal is indexed by academic databases such as the African Journals Online or the, open, the, the Director of Open Access Journals, for instance. If you look at South Africa, right, what South Africa has done is they're a bit ahead of us. Um, the, I don't know if it's NRA for... Yes, NRA. I don't know if it's NRA, but they publish a list of accredited journals that they expect researchers to... Well, if you publish in there, because the, one of the incentives that they offer in South Africa, I believe, I don't know if they've changed this, is you get paid for, for publishing, right? Uh, but you just don't get, get paid just because you published uh, on your blog or something. It has to be in a reputable publication venue. Um, so accreditation, the, the point of this slide is accreditation is something we have to think about. And it turns out that uh, these entities will not, um, will not pull metadata from your journal just because your journal exists. You need to conform to certain standards, like obvious standards such as, they will say, uh, your editorial board must comprise of a diverse group of individuals. So total signs of a predatory journal, for instance, is if everybody comes from the same country or the same institution, there's a problem there, or at least the, the assumption is that there's a problem there. What they expect to see is uh, people coming in from different universities or different countries forming your editorial team, right? Uh, but also, they will look at things like uh, the frequency of publishing. Are you consistent? If you're saying you're a quarterly journal, do you actually have four issues every year? Is that consistency there, right? So, so th there's, there's a set criteria that is usually published on these academic uh, databases, but, but I think the goal should be for, for the higher education authority when you set up this journal, the goal should be to make sure that uh, you plan for accreditation for some of these uh, important entities. Africa Journals Online. Yeah, uh, before you move from there. So yes. Africa Journal Online, you know you can accredit after how many issues? Uh, uh, that that, that I, would, I would have to check. Okay. But but I imagine uh, after maybe a year or two, it should be. After a year. Yeah. And the, that um, director of open access. Uh, again, I would have to okay. remind myself about the the, the criteria in terms of uh, after how many years, after how many issues, again, I've forgotten. I think uh, we'll go for the easier ones first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's also about, 
yeah. yeah. The profile of the drone itself. You obviously at some point you want uh, uh, you want the drone to to appear in these high profile yes, yes, that's cases idea. as well. Yeah. Are there fees for these? No, no. This is uh, they are free. This is free. Oh. Most of these are free actually, oh. as long as you because it's good for them as well. Mm. As, as long as you adhere to their set standards, then it's fine. And of course, the issue that you, you had raised, you, you need a valid ISSN yes, number yes. and all those things. <laughs> Don't look at those things as well. Um, but that's, and also things like the minimum, and I imagine these are conversations you're going to have. Uh, how, what is the minimum number of articles you have in an issue, for instance? Yeah. Th these are important decisions that you have to think about early on in the process. Because they look at they look at that as well. Um, I don't know if this has changed slightly. I I, I have to apologize that I, I have not uh, checked, but we can check it. But the, the point of this slide was that I mean, hey, listen, if you look at Zambia at the time of directing this this screenshot, we only had two right journals syndicating content to Africa journals online. So maybe we can uh, go online here and just say Africa journals online. Um, I think the guys from medicine had put something. Yes. Yeah, I know the, the medical, uh, uh, medical journal of Zambia is, uh, is one of those entities that are, but also, also the maybe the journal of preventive, uh, is it medicine or something? Um, but let's, let's try and see if things have, have changed. Um, and, and, and I imagine the authority has a role to play, right? In in, in actually making sure that, that uh, I see this has changed slightly, the interface. interface. I, think I think the authority has, has, a, has a role to play in, in helping raise the profile, profile right? If, if you look at Zambia here, here two, two still. Oh, let you zoom in here. Is this interactive map? I don't know if you can see. Two still. It's hard to, to conform yeah. to this. Okay, no, the problem is, although you have gone online, yeah. Yeah. the frequency is still a problem. Yes. And, and by, by the way, way uh, uh, whilst I didn't include this in my talk, it's something that wounds and struggles with as well. The law tax. Tell us, it's not easy to round up people and tell them to say, can you submit articles, right? It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's really hard, and which is why uh, you don't want to raise the bar high up there. Instead of being uh, overly ambitious and say, oh, we're going to be a quarterly journal, maybe you can just stick to, you know, two issues in a year. That's, That's fine, fine, because you know, know within, at least within six months, months you'll be able to uh, elicit nice articles, articles or something. I don't know. But, but also it depends on the area as well. It's, it's possible that looking at the number of higher education institutions, it's possible, possible that you probably attract a lot of, uh, you probably have a lot of submissions again. If it's an obscure area, for instance, it becomes difficult, right? Anyway, um, hopefully these are things we can think about as an authority to say, I mean, how do we encourage? Sometimes, Sometimes I've thought that maybe it's, it's an issue of awareness as well. So it's an issue of training. And perhaps some of these institutions are not aware of the importance of setting up journals, for instance. I don't know. Um, or deliberately making sure that they're indexed as well. All right. Um, another place where you want to obviously get content is the director of Open Access Journal. And again, when I was doing this, I uh, noticed that we had nothing from Zambia here as well. Um, I think, I think in, in part because, because we, we've only just recently started transitioning from paper-based journals to like electronic journals. Yeah. But it's also an indication that you don't have private companies that are online companies. Yes, and uh, something else that... Uh, so we want to roll there some of us. Yes, and something which, which we should do, there's a ready market, but, but something else that the authorities should think about here is... Uh, and it's, a, it's a debate that has been raging for many, many years, right? Whenever we meet, there's mention of the fact that you need an editorial office. You cannot run this. Uh, you cannot run a journal and expect that uh, uh, the editors are the ones that are going to do copy editing, they're the ones that are going to do desk reviews, they're the ones that are going to be checking for submissions. You need a dedicated resource. And if seeing as a well-resourced entity, if, if you want, want to improve uh, the, the quality of the journal, journal I highly recommend, recommend that you plan for a dedicated person who is going to oversee the journal itself. It's, it's a lot of work, and I'll talk about some of the things involved. You know, it's a lot of work, actually. Um, it's quite a bit of work here. But anyway, you can subcontract some of the things, like copy editing uh, or typesetting. Uh, we are fortunate because we have uh, Unza Press, 
So, for most, most of these journals, journals once, once authors send, send through um, revised manuscripts, we send them to Unza Press. And we have templates that have already been set up. Unza Press will properly format those things for us, make sure that the citation styles are on point, make sure that the margins are consistent, because quality matters, right? You don't want uh, people accessing your journal to come across one article where the title is using 15 point size, then there's another one which is using 12 points, right? Consistency is important. Um, but anyways, um, one, one of the easiest ways of going online is um, obviously you need to identify a piece of software you're going to use to go online. There's two options. You can subcontract a company to custom build a piece of software for you. Or you can do what we did as, as UNSA and you go for open source alternatives. There are a number of open source uh, software platforms that are available out there, but one of the most popular tools is uh, so-called Open Journal Systems, or OJS. Um, this is what we use for our journal platform. So this thing I was showcasing here, uh, this platform here is OJS. Of course, this has been customized. I'll talk more about this, but the Zambia ICT Journal uses uh, OJS. Um, the Medical Journal Zambia uses OJS. Um, I would say the Zambia Journal of Zaj this uses OJS. Now, now what you notice, notice is, because the tool is free, free available and open, but also this space is, this is the tool that powers these institutional repositories. This is freely available and open source. An institution uh, will not have an excuse for why they're not online, because this is freely available. You can go there and download this and install it, and they'll be up and running the same day, right? Assuming they have uh, servers um, and, and whatnot. So OJS. 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 The, the difference is in the fact that, that uh, when you download OJS, one of the things you do is you customize it so that you include your branding information. So HEA probably has colors specific to your brand, right, as an entity. You have the logo and all those things. That's it. Um, you have, have the choice, choice of if you try to go the open source route, you have the choice of if you have the capable, uh, not capable, but if your IT department, department is not overwhelmed, um, if they have the capacity to do this, they can do the customization or you can subcontract and somebody will create a theme for you. Um, and then the usual things about branding information is, uh, I mean, I'll talk more about this. In the back end, there are certain changes that you need to make as well, so that they're specific to what you do as an entity. So OJS is free, available, and open source. You can download it today. If I had time, we would have downloaded it and set it up, showcase a demo for each year to say, here we go, this is how your journal will look like. Uh, um, you can go here and download it if you want, at your own time. It's standards-based. Very important here because, you see, when you talk about syndication, uh, like, for instance, when you talk about, oh, uh, Africa uh, journals online, the reason they're able to pull content from these different journals, the this metadata, is because the assumption they are making, in fact, the requirement they will tell you is that you must implement the Open Archives Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting, or IPMH protocol. And it turns out that OJS has this implemented by default. Uh, incidentally, uh, institutional repositories that are powered by open source tools like DSpace will have this implemented by default. So we can check here and showcase that the product is activated for, for the user repository, for instance. This makes it a lot easier for you to have this content from these entities. In fact, it's automated. It's an automatic uh, process. Uh, by the way, beyond, sorry, I'm, uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Beyond just setting up the journal, HEA has this journal. Um, UNSA has a number of journals. Mugushi University has journals. Uh, Nkuruma is setting up a journal. Um, it turns out that, yes, yeah, Zikas, it turns out that there's a lot of interesting research that people do in these different higher education institutions. But who knows that they are doing this? Very few people know. Um, the HEA could come in and say, maybe we should set up a platform that's going to, similar to the ETD thing I was showcasing, 
a platform that will pull a different you know, research done by these different higher education institutions in a central location. Incidentally, by the way, we are, there's a prototype too we are uh, working towards with my, my students. Um, uh, it's not as appealing here, but uh, we're just trying to demonstrate that this is something that is feasible, right? It would be nice if we had, uh, it would be nice for policy makers actually, uh, nice for other higher education institutions so that there's no duplication of effort. It would be nice if we had, uh, I don't know why this thing is suddenly not, uh, there we go. It would be nice if we had something like this, right? Where we, for each institution, right, we, 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 we have details of what sort of research is being published. So that I don't scratch my head if I'm looking for who has done research in higher education. I'll start thinking which institutions are tied to higher education. Oh, there's HEA. I'll go to HEA and search for content. Oh, there's UNS. I go to the UNSA repository. Um, you know, it would be nice if we had something like this. But anyways, uh, something to think about, food for thought, because most of these entities are going online. Uh, it would be nice if we had something like that. This thing is implemented using a plugin architecture. Not only is it standards based, it's implemented on a plugin architecture. The, be the beauty of the plugin architecture is if HEA discovers to say the bare bones OJS platform doesn't have the things that HEA needs, you can develop a small little service within a short period of time. It's called a plugin, and they integrate it with OJS because it's freely available and open source. It's a lot easier for you to do to do this. Um, I don't know if I've had, I, I'll have time, but uh, I can showcase some of the useful plugins that we use at the UNSA. Um, so we, we use a plugin that allows us to deposit DOIs. Um, one of the important things to, if you want people to take you seriously, you want to be professional, right? And we all know that people uh, uh, will be biased here. You find some publication and there's a DOI number, you get excited and you, you won't actually be suspicious, right? There's some sort of authenticity associated with that DOI. Um, we've gone through quite a bit of uh, back and forth to actually set up the um, um, DOI service here. But we use a plugin is the point I wanted to put across here. Uh, a plugin that makes it possible for us to, um, uh, it makes it a lot easier but it also uh, increases the visibility of research. So you'll notice that if I click on this, there will be a corresponding DOI for each article that is deposited into the journal platform, there's a corresponding DOI. DOI, DOI. Uh, part of how we do this is there's a plugin. Um, I wonder if I can go to the dashboard here and showcase this notion of plugins, but I, I know Mr. Koshin understands the issue of plugins here, but um, plugins are everywhere these days. In, in Wade, when you're writing in Wade, sometimes you want to automatically insert citations and references, you will use a plugin because weight by default sometimes may not work like that. Um, but uh, anyway, in the interest of time, we can, we can always look at this plugin better on. Uh, so it's, it's based on a plugin collective, and it's popular, right? If you, if you look up the statistics on, uh, on PKP, you'll notice that there are a number of, uh, of entities out there that use OJS. The beauty when you have a lot of people using OJS is if you run into a technical challenge, you're more likely to find the solution online, yeah? Um, and like I said, for you to get started, all you do is you go there, you download this thing, and then you'll be on your way to setting up something similar to what we're seeing on the screen here. So that's a front-end view for one of our journals, JABS, the Journal of uh, Agriculture and Geomedical Sciences, uh, but also the back-end of JABS. Um, because before people can see what we are seeing here, there's a lot of work that goes on in the background. Authors must submit. Um, uh, editors must do desk reviews. Um, reviewers must be identified and attached to submissions. Uh, reviews have to be submitted by reviewers. The journal editor must combine all the reviews and come up with a decision. Um, once a decision has, ma has been made, if it's positive, that decision has to be communicated to the user, and the user, in most instances, asked to make changes relative to the reviews. A bare minimum copy editing. Once that is done, production, right? And then eventual publishing. 
all of that happens in the background. There's a workflow actually that is implemented within OJS. Uh, so in the event that you are thinking, oh, we'll hire an individual to custom build the software, uh, I would probably wouldn't do that. I would much rather go for an open source version and then have the contractor modify this to suit your needs. Because the, the basic features of um, a journal publishing platform will already be implemented here. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll go back to the back-end feature just now, but some of these things I've already showcased. I was showcasing uh, uh, medical journals, uh, Zambia, Zambia ICT journals, uh, Zajlis, there are a number of entities that have done this. Recently, uh, Nkuruma set up um, an OJS platform. I know this. I don't know if they started publishing. Um, but anyway, just, uh, again, if you have questions, feel free and uh, uh, interrupt me in case you forget. But uh, in terms of specific features that you'd be interested in, specific to OJS here, OJS can be uh, installed locally, so you have control over this. I don't know if HEA has uh, servers, if you have servers of your own. So if you do, if some of these, because I know you have a number of applications that you run, right? I don't know if they are hosted locally. If they are, you can actually download OJS and install OJS on one of your servers. If you need to purchase another server, you just purchase it, install OJS on the server, and then you'll be up and running. Of course, the other things that you have to do in the background, like uh, maybe register a domain if you need a dedicated domain, because the thing about the domain is um, branding as well, right? Do you want this, and this is very important, do you want this journal to be tied to HEA? In which case, maybe it would be uh, higher education, uh, uh, let's say higher education uh, journal or something, or higher education in Zambia journal. It will be dot .zm. That's one option. Or alternative, if you go for the first option, obviously you don't have to register a domain because it will be a subdomain on the HEA domain. But but if you want to leave this general, sure it's going to be run by HEA, but you want this to be like an international journal, not really just tied to HEA. Sure, HEA runs this. Then maybe you'd have to register a separate domain or something. I don't know, right? If you do this, obviously, the usual things, you purchase uh, domain names, not very expensive. Uh, you don't have to worry about hosting because you just told us that you have servers already in place. Yeah, but don't talk about the hosting, just in case you don't have the servers. Oh, yeah, so, so yeah. the options that are there, uh, I, I don't know if uh, HEA um, is affiliated with Xamarin. Yes, we are. Ah, there we go. Xamarin offers, uh, you know that they can register, Xamarin actually registers domains for free. So if, if you're affiliated, this can be registered for you for free. Um, hosting, I, I imagine, is going to be done for free. Because we do this, actually, ourselves. The NED portal that we are setting up, this thing that I said, the NETD, uh, I mean, it hasn't been, it's not operational yet. If you go to netd.ac.zm, this, uh, the domain was registered for free by Zamrin, because UNS is affiliated with Zamrin. It's a member. Um, hosting is done by Zamrin. So, so we, we don't really need to worry about those things here. Unless if you want, for whatever reason, usually if... Um, if, I'm an, if I'm a private entity. Sorry? If I'm a private entity. Ah, then, then uh, if you're a private entity, you, if you go for Zamrin, you'd have to pay. But if you're a private entity, you have the options of Infratel. You know, there are a number of entities in Zambia that, uh, in fact, even international organizations that can host for you. At a, at a fee. At a fee. Yeah. Um, and so you can host this locally, uh, or if you want, you can take advantage of these cloud-based services, quite a number of them. And then we see that uh, editors get to configure the requirements specific to a journal. Now, what you notice is uh, a number of things that are specific to a journal. Like a typical journal will have thematic areas. I imagine uh, once you launch this journal, there are specific sub areas within higher education that you might want to focus on, right? Maybe it could be like a curriculum review or something, right? Research and pu publication. So you configure these things as sections. And just to showcase is that what I mean here, if I go to um, if I go to a sample of jobs, for instance, I don't know if this is there. If I scroll up here, you notice that there are these sections. Book reviews, there are also articles. Sometimes there will be an ed editorial or something. Those are separate sections that you'd have to define. Um, but also what's important is you have to specify the review process. So 
one of the obvious things you have to decide is, is this going to be single blind, is it double blind? Or is, it, is that not going to be blinding at all? This can be configured. So do you want the authors to know who is reviewing their work? Do you want the reviewers to know who has submitted, whose work they're reviewing? The number of arguments being presented here, like uh, if I know that I am, uh, I am reviewing Dr. Mfune's work, I'll be biased, right? I mean, in fact, sometimes I, I know you know, I'll be biased here and say, well, this is an accept when <laughs> maybe it shouldn't be an accept or something. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I have a person of a system system so I hear, and I say, this is a reject here, right? So uh, should we go for double blind or single blind? The standard practice, at least in my field, is usually double blind. So the authors do not know, um, but also the reviewers do not know whose work. I mean, sometimes you can go the extra mile and just look at the writing and say, this is light on here, who's writing this. But Either way, um, the issue of bias comes in. These things can be configured in OJS, all right? Again, in terms of the review process, when you identify reviewers, reviewers are generally guided on what they are looking out for when they are reviewing a paper. Guidelines. I'm sure these are things you will discuss. Once you have a discussion of those guidelines, they can be configured so you can create a reviewer form in the back end so that the reviewers who have access to that form and feed it in on a scale of one to five think the related work was fine or something. The final decision is accept or clear accept or uh, accept with minor modifications or something or reject. There will be a form like that. Very important. Otherwise, you'll be faced with a situation where you'll be dependent on reviewers sending their feedback via email, which is what you don't want. You want to avoid that. Right? So you can configure these things. Um, this can be done at the very beginning once you uh, set up the platform. This can be done. It's not a difficult thing to do, but maybe because uh, we've done this for a while. So in terms of the configuration, I have a few screenshots to showcase this. These are the sections specific to, um, this is the, the Journal of uh, Law and Social Sciences. So because the Journal of Law and Social Sciences elicits publications from these broader domains like law, you know, humanities, there are instances when we create sections that are specific to these different disciplines. Yeah. But, but you can control this thing. Uh, um, if you want, I mean, I don't know if it's necessary, but I can easily go in and show you a sample rev uh, review f uh, form, for instance, if I go here and um, I perhaps uh, go to, should be workflow or something, under review here. Um, these are the sort of configurations. You, uh, in addition to the review form, you'll notice that you get to state to say when somebody has been identified as a reviewer, um, the expectation is, oh, we want you to tell us if you are willing to review this within a week. You configure that. So that if they don't, maybe they get an automated email to say, are you, are you still going to review this? Because if, if somebody is un unable to review, you want to find a replacement, right? But also, you can configure the amount of time they will have, the reviewer has to actually review the work. And it could be like, you have a month for you to review this, right? Send us feedback within a month. Of course, these things can be configured, you are just because, you know, academics will be busy sometimes and they, they may not be able to finalize the review within four weeks, you can adjust the settings, all right? Uh, and set reminders or send, re send reminders. So this is a form I was talking about, the sample form that we've created for JLS. Uh, I'll preview it so that people have an idea of this form. You notice here that uh, once a, a reviewer has been identified, an email is sent out to them with a link to the manuscript and the form to say, fill in this form. So they'll fill in the email address, in this case, the manuscript title, overall comment, uh, you know, significance in terms of the originality, the scale here. This, this by the way, is specific to the editorial team sat a long time ago and came up with a set of guidelines, right? Items to include in the, uh, the review form. And what we did when we went online is we just converted those guidelines into a tunic form like this. So this could be completely different to uh, what HEA would want to look out for. Uh, a nice starting point is always, and I imagine you're going to do this, you go to maybe these other journals that, are, um, that publish work that is going to be published similar to what HA is going to be publishing, and then you look at the, re the reviewer form they are using, and then you adapt that. And then at a later stage, once you set up OJS, you can then create this form. This is the problem you need to create. Um, uh, I don't know if there's anything else with 
showcasing here this is the blinding part I was <laughs> I was uh, I was talking about here um, and then you also have an option where somebody gets to specify if they have competing interests if I know uh, this is a case where it's a single blind I know uh, Dr. Mfuna say I don't want to review this uh, because I know this person and I may be biased and then this is where you get to decide if it's open review it, if it's single blind or if it's double blind or something yeah, just uh, there. Yes. Th there are these uh, journals that have a practice of saying, can you suggest... A reviewer. A reviewer. Yes. Um, There's an option... Is that good practice? And, um, well, what we've, I'll start with our experiences at UNSA. You, you know that uh, because, because there's no compensation, in fact, if you look at our culture here, finding reviewers is hard. Huh? Actually, even if there was compassion, finding people that are going to review academic work is not as easy as people might think. Um, and so the easiest way to, the approach we've taken, and this is standard practices, we recycle, we look at people that publish often in one of the journals, and we aim at them as being potential reviewers for the journal. So if perhaps you publish in JLSS twice or three times, you say, we invite you to review work that will be submitted in the future. And something else we do is we ask that you suggest people as well that can be reviewers. But also, that is usually the work that is done by the editorial team. Right? So the editorial team would be in part, and this is a practice at UNSA, they are tasked to look for reviewers. I'm, I'm part of the editorial team for JLSS, so if I'm Others as, as an editor for one of the thematic areas, one of the things I would have to do is when there's a new submission, I should look for appropriate reviewers for that submission. Yeah. So, but, but it's a decision that your editorial team would have to sit down and, and discuss at length, actually, uh, ultimately. Um, and maybe part of the review thing, I wanted to showcase some sample things that we've done in the past. Uh, maybe we can look at uh, perhaps things that have been submitted. I wonder if I can filter here by... Uh, um, by um, things that have gone to production so that we I think it's wrong to look at it. I wanted to showcase uh, this notion of uh, oh, I wanted to showcase this notion of uh, not there. I wanted to uh, we can look at this and that's fine so part of the workflow right the yeah, author submit and then the review part, we talk about reviews here. You usually have rounds of reviews, so you can configure this thing. The first round, where you have reviews coming from an odd number of reviewers, maybe three or five or something, usually three is what you go for, so that there's no tie, right? Um, but there are times when there will be, and I have to apologize to some society here, I hope, but there will be times when a review will be overdue. The editor tasked to run with this article or the section would have to follow up with, with this. So you log in and maybe you set a reminder. The reason I'm saying this is you will have to plan to train the editorial team on how to use this platform, capacity building. The OZA has tried. There's a number of training sessions that have been conducted since 2020. This may, well, I don't know, may seem like easy work, but, um, and, and I know it was very painful for the chief editors, uh, because at some point they were the ones doing this. It's a lot of work for you to do a desk review. You know where you are checking. Does this publication conform to the template? Is the correct citation style used? Have the authors not exceeded the page limit? It's a lot of work. Huh? It becomes a lot easier if you involve other members of the editorial board. But they, you can't just call them and expect that they'll be able to do this. They must be trained. Right? Um, because the editors are the ones to do these things, right? You follow up or you unassign a review or say want to assign this paper to somebody else or something. But anyways, um, that's that. I don't know if there's anything else worth mentioning about the reviewers. Um, uh, once you're done with this process, with the rounds of reviews, you can then, you know, maybe accept the submission so that it moves on to the next stage or something. But anyways. Um, the submission process, if you use OJS, it's purely online. 
So all you need is uh, a set of instructions on your website. Or when you're sending out a call for papers via email, say, we, we are soliciting um, uh, original articles for uh, an upcoming issue. And this is a deadline. You include a link to say, if you're interested, go to this link to submit. They'll go, they'll go to your journal uh, and then register for an account if they don't already have an account or log in if they already have an account, right? The whole process is online. And this is the beauty with this, right? You have a traceable record of everything that has been going on. You know, who submitted? When was this submission done? Who reviewed? When was the review done? What was the decision? Who did the copy editing, right? Um, and all those things. So the, the process is online. Um, and in terms of the online process, really the, the workflow is segmented into four main parts. Uh, authors, when they come here, if I go to, because I know I'm logged on here, if I go to journals of Unza, I'll tell them, and I discover, oh, Unza has a, a journal of law and social sciences, and um, I would want to submit work there. If I click here, um, there will be an about page, there will be information for authors, for readers, for everybody, right? So as an author, I'll be interested in finding information about this journal, right? What are the rules? What do I need to do for me to publish? Are there limitations? And this is where maybe you'd have a template, if you want, or guidelines. If, if creating a dedicated word template is too much work, the LaTeX template is too much work, you can have guidelines. But we have found, I have found at least in the past, that it's a lot easier if you create maybe a web template and tell people, download this and just use it as a basis to create your article. It's a lot easier. Otherwise, you'll be faced with a situation where a submission comes in, you have to check now, are, are the top margins conforming to this? You know? Uh, is the correct uh, font size being used for the body text? It's, that's a lot of work. But, but of course, it's made easier if you have a dedicated editorial team. So if you hire people that will be able to do these things. Um, yeah, and then, uh, like in this case, if you go to About Us and you go to Submissions, there will be details of, uh, of uh, you know, an option for you to log in or to register. And when you log in, you have an interface as an author. Um, at your own time, by the way, if you go to journals.unza.zm, you can actually create accounts for whatever journal you feel uh, you're interested in and then just poke around and see the form that you would use as a potential author for these different journals. Yeah? And the whole process is purely online and um, maybe just a bit more about the workflow. Four stages. The first stage here is for the uh, author. When the author makes a submission, that article will find itself under submission. And in fact, if I check JLSS and I look for submissions that are unassigned. These are in the submission stage. If I check for all submissions and I try to filter, you notice that I have the option to filter submissions that, uh, uh, submissions that are in submission stage, review stage, copy editing stage, and production, the four stages. So you essentially go through these stages. Um, initially, uh, when an article is submitted, it will go under, and I'll look at uh, something that maybe has been, I wonder if I can look for something that is, maybe something that has been archived because it's, in, it's published or something. If I look at, uh, if I look at this publication, I, I have a traceable record of these different workflows. It's, it's under production here because it's already been published, but initially it will find itself here. It is here that, uh, and this is a decision you have to make. In our case, the chief editor, because if you look at the Journal of uh, Law and Social Sciences, the editorial board comprises of a number of people, right? Yeah, these people here. So the chief editor, the first thing the chief editor does is when a, there's a new submission, he has to identify which of these people is going to be tasked to oversee that article, to look for reviewers, to do a disk review. So they'll come here under submission and assign a journal editor. Once a journal editor is assigned, the journal editor will do uh, the pre-screening. So there's an option where you have a back and forth with maybe the other editors or with the author, right? If you want to reach out to them and tell them, oh, you didn't use a template, please use a template and resubmit, right? Uh, or you reach out to the author and say, well, 
what you've submitted is outside the scope of what we publish here. If somebody submitted, submits something to do with engineering in your journal, I mean, why would you want to publish that, right? Uh, but we've seen such journals here. Uh, so you write to them and tell them to say, at this stage, no, we've declined because this is outside the scope of what we do. Once you're done with the desk review, uh, as, as the journal editor, you then move this to review stage. When it comes to review stage, the journal editor would then have to, this was skipped up, but they will have to identify the reviewers. I wish I could, uh, uh, I don't know why they sent this to me here, but yeah, I'm just going to come back here and see if we can. That's curious. Impression of women and damage the environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very strange uh, research here, right? Uh, done. <laughs> it would be interesting to find out what, what the results were, is it? Uh, I wonder if we can, maybe I can move to. Yeah, so just as you are navigating. Yes. So, you know, the other system is that um, you have an editorial team and then you assign an editor to an issue. Is that the system? Not an issue, the strategy is. Um, because each issue will attract, um, the thematic areas will be different. The composition of the editorial board for at least the journal I'm associated with is such that, in fact, all the DRGS journals, is such that you have people that have different or varying expertise. So the first thing you do is you identify out of the editorial team, which person is better placed to look at, it. yes. Okay. So it's done by article. So okay. if let's say, and, and if let's say in a particular month we receive five articles. It's possible that all those five articles will be sent to you because you're an expert in a particular area, or to him because you're an expert in that particular area. But again, maybe because of manpower, what you can do is you can say, well, irrespective of whether you're an expert, you're going to be assigned, everyone is going to be assigned an equal share so that there's distribution of uh, effort or something. So, yes. and, uh, the difference between a reviewer and an editor, I mean, getting them confused. Oh, yeah, so, so an, an editor is a person who's part of the editorial team, mm -hmm. so they're the ones that are responsible for performing the different tasks associated with the journal, looking for reviewers, helping with copy editing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are important discussions that have to be made. In fact, there are instances when editorial team members will act as the journal, so, but there's a difference. A reviewer can, uh, when you set up a journal, the obvious place where you tap into reviewers is you go to these uh, research institutions, like you identify people from UNSA, from CBU, from Mungushi, that can review uh, the articles that will be submitted. Because you, I imagine as, as HEA, you probably, you don't have, uh, you won't have um, enough people to review this for you. UNSA can manage, right? Because what? Uh, post 900 or so academic stuff, we almost always are able to find reviewers, right? But if you're an organization like HEA, you have to start thinking about where are we going to find reviewers? The editorial team, can you can be part of the editorial team. Because it turns out that the editorial team actually, by the way, will comprise of maybe people that will perform certain tasks that have very little to do with what is going to be submitted. So I wanted to know to say the reviewers should have like expertise, yes. specialization. They should be a renowned, actually. Yes, and not an editor. So an editor mm -hmm. is more of a facilitator. Yes, okay. yeah. Yeah, because your people in your editorial team, right, some of them will be responsible for following up with, let's say, uh, because I know you don't have, uh, HEA doesn't have uh, a team that does typesetting or publish, so you hire, hopefully you come to Unza Press, you come to Unza Press and you say, could you typeset this for us? Somebody has to follow up, right? Has Unza Press finalized the typesetting? Maybe there's a delay. It has to be somebody from the editorial team. So, so, so the, the team really would comprise it's up to you to decide on who you are going to invite as, a, as an editor. Um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Let's see the editorial advisory panel. Oh, the advisory board, yes. Uh, these are renowned academic from okay. these high profile institutions. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's usually not a problem, especially when uh, I imagine you know of colleagues that would be keen to sit on the advisory panel, advisory board. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, and this is, by the way, this is the part where I was saying they will look at uh, the diversity of mm. 
Now, I'll be the first one to tell you there's a problem here, right? <laughs> the editors are all from Unza here. Mm -hmm. That's yes. okay. Yeah, but, but for certain, um, it's okay, but for uh, accreditation. Like, if uh, you look at the rules for the Director of Open Access uh, Journals, I think it is. Yeah, the, they look the, at this the, the, the problem that you have is that they are all editors. Right. When you, when you look at standard international practice, largely an editor of one or two, but the editorial board. Right. Well, so actually, this <laughs> is a, by the way, this is a just misrepresentation. Yeah. This is. This is actually the editorial board. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is uh, this needs to be changed. This is the editorial board. Yeah. This is a problem. I want <laughs> to showcase <laughs> some. Uh, there's a DRJ's journal that is. They are very serious. Mm. Our colleagues in the life sciences here. If you look at the editorial board for them, I hope they've changed this slightly. It's a bit diverse. Uh, not really. I thought it was going to be diverse. But one would argue that, uh, I guess you'd say the editorial board also comprises of the advisory board members. Yes, yes. So it's, um, it was a bit of diversity. Yeah, yeah, I know what, what happened. So yeah. it, it, there's an assumption in the UNSA journal that the chief editor is the editor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, <coughs> I prefer you have the editor who is overly responsible for that with the team. Yes. But you also have an editorial board. Yes. I, I agree. Now, unfortunately, being a uh, public institution, yeah. it's money, right? You, what that means is you need to create a budget line for that. Okay. And it would be nice, really. I hope this is something you can think about because you can act as a model, mm -hmm. uh, local journal that has done things right, right? And then people can learn from what you're doing. You showcase to say, if you have dedicated people that have been hired to perform specific things, the quality is going to be world class, you know? Anyway. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so there's a review stage um, in terms of time. I don't know if we want to do that, but but what you you do as part of the review stage is um, we can do that. Actually, let me see if we can get to. I don't know if Jonas does this, but we'll see. The process I mean here would. Um, so. So, so this is what you have under review stage. It is at this stage that when you assign, remember I said under the submission stage, you assign an editor. The editor will be responsible for looking for maybe three reviewers or something, if, if, you, are, if you have three reviewers or five reviewers. This is where you add the reviewers, right? You add them. Um, and then the configuration of, oh, you need the reviewer to send you feedback within a week. This will be typed what you have here. Um, and then you have, by the way, it's at this stage as well where, because sometimes reviewers will annotate the submission. If you annotate it in Microsoft Word, you upload the annotated version which will be sent to the, to the authors to incorporate the changes. And then you have copy editing. This is where you change uh, things. To dis these are house styles, really. Type, typographical errors and all those things. Sorry? He's the chief editor for jobs, eh? Ah, yes, he's Professor Yamino, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And I, uh, yeah, I saw something, a piece on Facebook, because I follow you on Facebook. There was an event happening at, is it Chiel or something? Bonanza, was that? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Yamino, yeah. Yeah, he's the one who's been running Jonas. And doing quite a, a good job, I would say, but I know his complaint for the longest of time was how much work he, ha he has had to do. But I think the training has helped, because the number of people that are sit on the editorial board for Jonas, and now able to do the things that he previously used to do. And it's a lot of work, right? Desk reviews, depositing DOIs, it's a lot of work. The beauty though is that if let's say you, you do this uh, twice a year, you only get to do some of these things just two times in a year. Okay. So it becomes bearable. And then finally, once the copy editing is done, typos have been fixed, house rules have been applied to the thing, you then publish and then it will appear online as an issue. So this is what you would uh, see here as, um, as the different issues. If you look at JLSS, we've had all these issues. Volume five, number two, volume five, number one, uh, volume four, number four, all of these. All of these are the different issues. So the last time you issued one was 2021? So the, not quite. The reason it appears like this is there's a backlog so the issues are tied to years. 
We have a backlog, and that has been a, a challenge, a bit behind. But the publishing, if, if I open this and we look at the publication date, notice that, that this was this issue was published yeah, this year. Yeah. The, the way we name our issues is they're tied to years. Um, yeah. But we are catching up. I know we are catching up because there are special issues that have been earmarked for publication as well for JLSS. Um, it is hard to... Um, but you're fortunate if you look at your journal. It's very hard to, to find people that can publish academic literature here, right? Uh, if yeah. you look at Zambia, if you look at it our is, context. It is, it is very much. But, but, but the beauty is if you decide to take the approach where this is tagged as an international journal, it can potentially attract yeah. people from outside Zambia as well. That usually helps. And that's what you want. You don't want, uh, you want diversity. You know, there's a subscription you know, module. This is tied to whether you decide to have this to be purely open access or whether you want people to pay money before they can access articles. You will configure this in the back end. Yeah. If you want this, simple yeah, switches here. We want to really go open access. Yes. So that self sustaining. Yeah. yeah. Um, these are all things that you configure in the back end. It has a feature that allows you to comprehensive index, but you have to do the work yourselves. Okay. So you go in the back, back end, and then you make necessary configurations, and then boom, your content will be indexed in Google Scholar, these other academic databases. And then the, the usual stuff, if I, there's a feature that uh, is available that allows you to read the document um, right within the browser, right? Uh, or you can download it if you want to, but you can actually read. It's a simple thing, standard, I guess, but I thought I'd mention this. It's a feature anyway. It's a reading tool. Um, this is a big one. Email notification. Right? The fact that um, at, at each, if you notice, the four stages, when an, a, a, an author submits, a potential author submits an article, you want to know that it's been submitted. It's emails that are generated. And you configure these in the background. You configure who should receive these emails and all those things. Um, when a reviewer has been identified, when you add a reviewer, you want the reviewer to be notified to say, you've been um, ad added as a reviewer for this article with details of how they can access the article. An email has to be generated. Right? Um, this is an inbuilt feature, but you have to configure the tool so that it does this. Um, I have an example here of... Um, I guess a notification uh, for when an issue is published. You get that notification. I mean, these are trivial things you, you, can, you can obviously sort out, like which email address you're going to be using, right, to, to send out these notifications. It has to be obviously affiliated with HEA, that's always professional. Or in the event that you, you decide to go with this approach where you set up a dedicated domain for this, then there will have to be maybe an article to say, uh, uh, maybe journal at hezj.org.zm. Actually, this is academic, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but in the notifications. And then there's obviously online help as well. Um, I think the, the fact that, no, I think the fact that this is freely available and open source makes it a lot easier for you to find help if you need help. This could be to do with initial setup, but the initial setup is not difficult, I tell you. Maybe because we've done this for a number of times here. Uh, if, if you need help, uh, if you're an editor and you're doing something and you're unable to do something, you're unable to perform a particular task, you can easily find help online. Uh, we've noticed this with a number of uh, the editorial team members where we'll get stuck doing something. You know, I, can't, uh, I can't submit a review or something. And this is where your editorial team becomes important because they'll be there to offer assistance. Yeah? Or they'll write, the reviewer writes, I, I'm unable to, to review this article, submit the form or something. Somebody has to be on standby. I don't know if it will be IT. I don't know if it will be this dedicated um, editorial team. Um, but I've always thought, because this is a, a huge problem, if you decide to set up an editorial team, Maybe you could do it in such a way that uh, for the basic things, which other 
high education institutions may be interested in that service, they can tap into what you have and maybe pay an extra fee. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to do that. A reasonable fee or something. Yeah? Um, the reasonable fee. I mean, a few other, there are a couple of other, you know, features that may not have mentioned, but I think this is sufficient to maybe tell you to say you probably want to go the OJS route. Support is, is easily available and all those things. Come on. Let's just wait for this to load and then you can proceed with that. Um, I don't know if, uh, as we're waiting for this to show up, I don't know if uh, some of these things we've already discussed. Um, um. No, I think that's what will be probably the discussion for, for the afternoon. Yes. Um, but our proposal so far is to have a, an editorial board yes. um, that uh, is responsible for policy and uh, yes. commissioning, uh, even special issues and yes. so on. So it is that policy which will, I mean the editorial team that will decide on the editorial policy, the guidelines, and um, the number of issues. Uh, we were thinking of two issues yeah. uh, a year, but uh, maybe we may want to start with one <laughs> yeah. to learn from that. So we're going with that. Uh, then the, the, because of the nature of what we do, the advisory board, the editorial board, should have people from HEA, yes, and people from the other white assurance agencies and also international people. Right. Uh, but for the actual editorial team now, it has to be the, because we have a, a, a section, yes. a standards and research section. Oh, uh, right, right. Yeah, so it, it will comprise the editorial team and those that also, um, whose JDs have to do with IT and publication, yes. uh, will become part of that team. Yeah, I, I do know that uh, at some stage you realize that uh, it's quite a bit of work here, but but um, but but if you if you can tap in into the different expertise within the organisation, I think it's possible for a start. Yeah, but you test the waters and yes. see. If, yeah. But if we restructure, it would be good to just have uh, the administrative uh, aspects. Yes. Go to a specific uh, individual on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Because I think that has been quite of the challenge at times. I know because I think the journals are one of the eight times on that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, we hope we can create a structure. But for now, we have people whose job already is research and publication. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and they get paid for that. So yeah. They, yeah, they have to earn their money. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Can we see okay. who is uh, who's JD has that? It's a lot of like meaning is beyond the scope of the job. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it might just turn out that it's actually an easy way. I mean, <laughs> going to that proportion. I have some people have to end their money. Yes. You talked of the Zambi National Research Portal. I wanted to find out who manages this one. So, so this is experimental. Uh, our, our research lab manages this. And the reason why I snuck in some of those things is, uh, in fact, even this national ETD portal, mm -hmm. it needs uh, a place to sit. We are happy to give it to HE. We are happy to work with HE and give you the national research portal because I think this is you, actually. This is your work. And the reason I'm saying this is, uh, if you look at the lab, right, this data that, that, that lab research group I'm talking about, well, I'm here today. I may not be there next year, right, next month. But we know that each year will always be there. When you're setting up these sort of things here, you must identify custodians for these things. So currently, um, it's run by our research group. Um, but when it goes into production, when this thing is going into production, they have to be run by an entity which will always be there. There is to twice. We are happy to do that. Um, no, I noticed the way it was flowing, the Chinese so what did you to say who? Ah, right, right. So, so this, this is, uh, it's, it's actually, by the way, this, uh, the, way, the reason we have time is because this is test data. So we have all the institutions, we are pulling for, the idea behind this is, it was, it's supposed to have 
research from all the research institutions, the education institutions. JCTR, ZIPA, and all these different entities, ZARI, right? Uh, but um, we are very happy to talk to you about handing over, by the way. In fact, the only thing we'd be interested in ourselves is a high profile event where we are giving publicity, say, uh, we are behind this. That would be nice, sorry? You can't the report. Yes, exactly. Um, for us, that increases our, the profile of our research group as well. Work has already been done. Uh, we don't have to worry about the cost implications. Hosting is free. The domain is free, right? Yeah, I was just uh, yeah. what, what I see, Kawesha, uh, here is that um, I, I think we need a, a research page on our, on our site. And, and it's really good to say we have all helped symposiums in quite a few papers that we've done. Yeah. yeah. There is no proceedings, no one. So I think we need to create that um, yeah. uh, page. Especially now that we have journal. And we, we need a repository that will include all the publications we have had so far. The State of Education Report is, I think we need to discuss this. The, the best uh, place to start? This space. This space. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, we are, first, we, require, we are asking the institutions to have a repository and the research management system. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, oh, there's that requirement now? Huh? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this. I'm only six. Only six. I think I mentioned this. Only six out of, uh, and the expectation for us is at least this public higher education institutions must have a repository because we know at least at the bare minimum this public higher education institutions conduct research. So where are they archiving this research? Right? Yeah. Um, I think the private ones can get away with it, but you know. So it would be nice if. Uh, you know, we follow up on this. We're thing. trying to change that perception. It's <laughs> yeah. a different class for private and public. Exactly. If we, if we don't change that perception, then it, it will persist with the employers to say, we just look at things as CPU and the rest, and the people coming from Unilas and this, we can't consider them. So I, I agree, I totally it. agree. And I've noticed certain institutions, institutions like Unilas, like like for instance, I mean, they are really coming up. If you look at their repository, for instance, <laughs> they're doing some really impressive work there, right? So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad, glad that. Um, that's part of um, what is being done here. All right. Um, so what follows are just uh, the screenshots that I was showcasing here, like the workflow. This is for submission, things that typically happen. Um, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. No, it's fine. Um, does this, um, the software called JS, yeah. does it have the capability of creating a database for reviews? Yes. 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 Uh, I can, can showcase, showcase this right right now. Right now um, if I go under, I'll, I'll go into JLSS because I I'm, I'm, I'm confident with what's going on here. If I go under users and users here, all the registered users would be here, right? And you can filter by role. So if I come here, out of all these users, uh, how many are they? Ooh. Yeah, I don't know what's happening here, but that's, that makes sense because there are some people that are interested in, in just viewing content. If I just search for reviewers, right, I see that all of these are reviewers, 124. And in fact, when you, uh, as an editor, you have permissions to actually add new reviewers to your database. So if you identify a potential reviewer, you go here and you add them as a reviewer so that when when they receive that automated email, they're not forced to register an account. But of course you can you can do it in such a way that you add a new reviewer and then they register when they log in. So what I mean here is uh, if I wanted to if I wanted to uh, Let's see, something that hasn't been assigned or something. I don't know if this is uh, I wonder if, uh, okay, this hasn't gone to view stage. I wanted to showcase, uh, perhaps won't be able to do this, but I really wanted to showcase uh, uh, an option where, this hasn't gone there as well. An option where you can, you can actually add a reviewer. And it's very important, right, because uh, your database has to grow. 
what, what, the, the beauty, beauty of the delegates, the, the point you raise is important. The beauty of the delegates is when, as an editor, right, you're on the editorial team and as an editor you've been asked to run with an article, the very first place where you want to look for an, a, a reviewer is where? In your database. And it turns out that there's a way of filtering these things. Um, I don't have access to adding a new reviewer, but you can go back to users maybe and filter these users by review and hope that we'll be able to see um, <coughs> there's supposed to be a view where you you get to you get to see the uh, you get to see the uh, you, you get to see the um, the interest of the reviewers and that's what's important right if, if you look at this this is the information you'll be looking for. So a reviewer database allows you access to look at the, you can filter based on expertise. So if you're looking for some, some, somebody who is really good at, who is able to review, at, uh, or is an expert in curriculum development, you go in the database and you just filter by curriculum development and then you assign the reviewer. So there is that option. Yeah. Um, just to mention that uh, as part of the submission phase, some obvious things that you'd be looking at here is desk reviews, right? Checking for house rules and all those things. Um, trivial things. Sometimes you may think these are trivial, but important. Like when an author submits something, they haven't specified their affiliation, right? Um, they they have not specified their email uh, addresses or something. Um, that information is important because. It is the information that you see on the public facing side of things. So if I come here and I want to look at this article here, this information you're seeing, the title, the name of the author, the affiliation, even their ORCID number, if your, your guidelines are going to require that, they appear here because somebody has entered them in the background. So as part of your desk review, if there's information that is missing, you get back to the author. Please include keywords because you forgot to include them. Yeah. Please include your ORCID number because it's not there. Uh, um, your abstract has not been entered in the form. It may be there in the actual PDF document or Word document, but it needs to be added on the form itself, right? Because this is that's metadata information that appears on the public facing side of, of, of OJS. Anyways, um, what's important though, is as as, a, as an authority here you'd have to sit down and come up with very brief guidelines to say as part of a desk review what are the things we're going to be looking out for right um and then once you're done with the desk review the next stage is you're moving this to the next stage sending it for review or you de you decline right um the other option is you say skip review if it's an editorial for instance if you've asked a renowned uh, researcher to prepare an editorial or something it doesn't have to be subjected to peer review now does it so you skip the review um, and then you come to review stage i've already touched on this um, you add reviewers you follow up on reviews uh, once you are done there's a back and forth between the different reviewers because sometimes there'll be a tie right i as reviewer number one will think no we should accept this is a beautiful article here mm -hmm. somebody else will say no this should be a reject right you can't just make a decision. There are discussions that take place between the reviewers. And this is standard practice, actually. So this is done on this particular. So what reviewer one says uh, is sent to reviewer two, and what reviewer two says is sent to reviewer one. <coughs> when the reviews are done, yes. uh, all the reviewers, you can configure this such as all of the reviewers see the reviews. Because this is anonymous. In fact, standard practice that if if you are three reviewers you will not know the details of the other reviewer mm. unless if you decide amongst yourselves to share your contact details right but you have access to the review itself the review, yes. yes and then as the editor you combine the two and come up with a decision mm. before you come up with a decision sometimes you ask them but the point raised by reviewer one seems to be valid do you not think you as reviewer two do you not think that you need to alter your final decision once that is finalized then you combine the results and communicate to the user sometimes if there's a time if it's a contentious issue you may decide to invite somebody else right to make a decision but ultimately these are 
these are things that you would include in your guidelines. So maybe mm. the chief editor will have a final say or something. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just to, to take it back a bit. Yes. Uh, I think it's concerning this as well. You said the uh, DOI. Yes, this object what's identifier. The, what's the, you said that uh, you know sometimes you'll be reading something, you see the DOI, and you're like, does it provide credibility? Or yes, I mean, it's subjective, obviously, but. Uh, it, it shows that you are professional in yeah, what you're doing. As a journal? As a journal. As, okay. as an organization running that journal, my dear. Okay. So the, the idea with the DOI is it's, it's called a persistent identifier. Um, over the last couple of years, it's, it's associated with authenticity of the journal, right? But the purpose it serves is simple. You know how you come across dead links online? something that was uploaded a long time ago you try and click on it you have error 404 or something well DOIs prevent that from happening I, imagine a situation where the journal is currently sitting on this domain right and then somewhere down the line maybe 15 years from now HEA rebrands you are no longer a higher education authority of Zambia something else when you rebrand your name changes right maybe uh, I don't know, maybe you become educational authority of Zambia or something. If this changes and you change your domain name, all the links that we are pointing to hezj.org.zm will become dead links because you abandon this usually. So you get around that by using what's called a persistent identifier. There are different types, handles, you know, pure URLs and, and also DOIs. DOIs are usually associated with scholarly research output. Um, it's, it's not very expensive. In fact, I think uh, currently countries that are considered, uh, uh, is it, uh, what's, what's the technical phrase? Low, middle income countries or something, I forget. I think there's a concession now. We don't, so as UNSA, we've not been paying money for the DOIs because of that. But even when we were paying money, it was a very minimal amount. It's manageable. And by the way, these costs are part of the reason why some journals would decide to say, for us to fund this journal, money has to come from somewhere, right? We will get the money from author or article processing charges, APC charges. So the authors will pay us a very little amount, which when you combine those amounts, they will allow us to run this journal. But, but if you can fund this, then it's fine. You can leave it open, access like that. Yeah, so the DOI with the open journal system? No. You make a subscription. There are different entities that we were, um, the popular one is Crossref. We're with Crossref ourselves. But there's also data site. Um, so if you go to Crossref, there are details on how you can subscribe for a DOI. They'll give you a DOI number. Um, you can also go to data site. Uh, data site will provide you details of that. And the beauty with that, um, in fact, now you you know the in referencing material in your bibliographies, you are also encouraged to have uh, the DOI. Yes. Because when I click there, then I can go straight to yes. that, uh, where the journal is. It just shows that you are professional as an organization yeah. and it comes the practice. It's something that you probably need to seriously think about here. Uh, well, we, we, we certainly have to do that. Yeah. Maybe the first publication may be a little bit good, uh, yeah. but as we Go on. <laughs> 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 no, you know, it starts from some of these ones. We started as paper based and we've just yeah. been, you know. In fact, if you look at the old, um, yes, yes, the yes. old uh, yeah. issues here, you can yeah. literally see the quality. Yeah. It has been yeah. bad, actually. It's, it's just that, you know, a journal is not like any other publication. You see, the way we are publishing the State of Our Education Report. Um, for that, we are forgiven. This this is not peer reviewed material. Yeah. This is you see that kind of. Thing. But for journal, because there is always that aspect of saying there, what are known as high impact factor yes. journals. Then you have others are low impact. Then you even have predatory ones. Oh yes. Uh, so where you publish um, counts, uh, such that um, maybe for here we're going for H index. But in other countries, they'll say, look, for you to go to this level, 
you must publish in a journal with an impact factor of yes. more than one. Or they may say, for you to go to this level, you have to publish in a journal that is indexed in Scopus or yes. Web of Science or Web of Knowledge. And even grant institutions do they that. Look before at that, they yeah. can give you a grant, then they say, but where has this guy published? Yeah. Yeah, so or even certain jobs like postdoctoral fellowships, for instance. Yes, so look yes, at, uh, yes. let's say you must have published in this high yeah. impact. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what we're dealing with is not like the usual publications we've been having yeah. uh, because of the space in which it is. It's quite competitive. I'm it talking about quality, just to, just to digress a bit and to shoot you a bit on your journal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, pu you published a journal that says portrayal of women through Zambian means. Yeah. And uh, this person, uh, what's her name, Minalula Mboa, only looked at 100 Facebook memes and focused on 30 of them to prove that there's a negative stereotypes of women in memes and yeah, so there's some, some in some science, yeah. when, when actually even Facebook shows that uh, a 20 to 30 year old looks at an average of 30 memes a day. So. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that biased or I think so. Now, now this is the part where mm. you look at um, the reviewers, right? Because, the, well, it is the journal, but ultimately the people that have the final say are those three people, five people you've told, look at this. Is this worth publishing? And sometimes, right, in your journal, you will not have control over what goes in there because sometimes the reviewers, yeah. maybe people that are outside of HA, in fact, even outside of Zambia. So if all three of them say this... <laughs> But of course, <laughs> of course, uh, I, I think this is where you have, uh, I don't know if you've heard of retractions, this, right? This is a journal. When you, journal you sorry? sorry? Which journal is that? JLS. Yeah. yeah. JLS is not uh, one of the, this is a graduate, huh? It, 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 yeah. historically it has been. So, yeah. the DRJS journals, the three, JABS, Jonas, yeah. and JLSS, were meant for to be having for students. postgraduate students before they graduate to publish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, but increasingly, even you know, uh, faculty staff, staff, staff do that. Yes. But by the way, I was, I was about to mention the issue of retractions. Mm -hmm. If you identify a fundamental flaw like this, if that is a fundamental flaw, when you report, there's a retraction. And we've heard about retractions, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, yes. that's, that's that definitely, if you're looking at that sample size, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you look at the magnitude of the sample, and then somebody says, I took 100, but only focused on 30. Yeah. And this is my conclusion. And people look at about uh, 20 to 30 means a day. Yeah, yeah. so uh, how do you generalize those findings? Yeah. 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 Tricky here, which is why I, I think even the selection of reviewers here, you want to be very careful. Maybe the people that looked at that were not even... Um, Experts when it comes to social media or something, I don't know, or memes. But, um, anyways, I was I just digressing. Yeah, no, it's an important conversation. I mean, things that you probably hopefully discuss um, when, when you're setting up the journal. When you apply for DOI, they'll give you a DOI number. This is what uniquely identifies UNSA here. So, that number, 10.53974, means it's UNSA. But what we've done as UNSA is we've modified that slightly so that. Each journal is identified based on the DOI number. So the DOI number appears like this. So we know from here that this is JOS. If it's Jonas, there'll be a Jonas here, Jabs and whatnot. And so we can use the same DOI number tied to UNSA for all the different journals we have on the journal platform here. In fact, I don't know why there's been a delay. We use the same DOI number uniquely identify things in the repository. The point I'm trying to put across is when you start archiving conference proceedings, you can use the same DOI number, but just modify it slightly so that you differentiate content in the journal and content from conference proceedings, or content that's going to be in your repository if you're going to set up a repository or something. Anyway, so the review. Um, and I'm just showcasing like a sample form which I already showcased here, a completed form and uh, also the, the, the empty form here that somebody has to fill in or something. Um, and then you have copy editing. Really, this is the part where you, you can do this in different ways. You can force the user to fix the issues, but if you're obsessed with quality, you can fix these issues yourself. Now, what this means is you have to hire a copy editor. There are professionals like that, right? In fact, discipline-specific copy editors. They'll look at like phrases or words or spellings that have to be used or something. 
um, what if what works for the Unza is uh, the author alongside the reviewers will help fix the issues but that's bad here it's better when the reviewers send feedback to the user the user makes the changes before this goes to production you send it to a professional copy editor they thoroughly go through the document fix any typographical errors, style errors and everything else and then it's typeset and then it's published but that comes at an added cost obviously because copy editors are not, they are quite expensive. Can you, can you share the same thing you know, in terms of spelling, in terms yes. of use, you know, somebody's, we are British, but somebody's leaning on American colloquial, like, yes. well, what are yes. you doing? Yes, yeah. Can you share the same thing? Yeah. Okay. But uh, again, if, uh, I hope maybe each year has uh, people with JDs speak to this task, maybe they can, <laughs> they can yeah, look yeah, at the two issues, okay. I don't know something to think about here but this is this would be an editorial office I guess to look at this and then you have um, production right once you're comfortable with the copy editing the result and usually what happens is there's a back and forth okay. there's a comment the, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to showcase um, there's a, there's a back and forth that I, we had for um, a an article that we published recently, the, the, the lot of back and forth that came from here, right? This is what we're talking about here, where they were pushing most of these. They made changes and then, uh, this is outside of the system, obviously, this is the final system. Can you log in and check the, the modified version? Okay, until we got to a stage where we were, we were actually comfortable with, uh, with, uh, with the changes. But, but, but anyway, what you want ultimately is you want something that is not just aesthetically pleasing, but something that is professional, something that has no mistakes. Mistakes, mistakes could be, oh, the, the caption for the table is below instead of above, right? It just looks bad, right? Uh, or you find that, uh, some simple spelling mistakes anyway. But, but, but I, if you have the resources, I'll, I'll go for the part where you, you just uh, send this to a professional copy editor. Because think about this for a second. If you're saying you're going to have two issues, maybe it's a minimum of five articles in an issue, you're looking at paying a copy editor for 10 articles in a year. It can't be that expensive. I don't think it'll be that expensive. But you can test maybe the first couple of issues, you can run them yourselves and look at the relative amount of effort required and also the quality that comes out of that process and then decide on whether you want to go for professionals or not. But, but I think this is an opportunity for you to set the standard, right? These other institutions will follow what you're doing to say, for us to, to get to a stage where we're able to pro produce high quality articles, we must do what HEA has been doing or something. Mm -hmm. But Dr. you said something that's a bit contradictory, so that's maybe at 1.1 1 .1 billion have like control over what we publish. So the control is uh, the content, not okay not the quality of the writing, there's a difference. The, the, the content, like the, if, if I submit an article to do with curriculum review, how does HEA know that uh, the things I'm writing about, like the, the meme example you just gave there, there's no way of JLSS knowing that uh, what has been written actually makes sense, unless if somebody signals, right, that there's something wrong here, and then they'll investigate. The reason we didn't actually pick up on that is we don't even know who reviewed that, right? We just reliant on those three reviewers and their feedback. If all of them say this is an outright accept, we're going to accept it. Unless if you guys are going to decide to say we'll have uh, this additional step where even though the reviewers say, yes, yes, this is true, we'll have another person mm. look at this, but that's, <laughs> who is that person? And that's more work again. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and maybe this is where the problem is because um, if you see the problem is when you look at an institution like Onza, I think it has not utilized the Unza Press optimally. Right. Because the idea of Unza Press is that you have professional editors. Yes. So now what a professional editor will do like for a journal is when, uh, you know, because you have three reviewers, mm -hmm. and sometimes these reviewers 
may differ in their views. Yeah. Uh, and so the editor also looks at the merits yes. of that, the comments, and can say, okay, this will go for publication. This will not go for publication and communicate to the author. But this is easier for these guys who are employed professional. They is a whole machine yeah. like Springer, yeah. you know, Francis and Taylor. Um, but when you have uh, these ad hoc um, kind of arrangements that we have in our institutions, uh, these is matters is the escape. I agree. Yeah. And so you raise an important point of the meta review. And in fact, that's a point of one of the most important reasons why you need a, a, an editor tied to an article is ultimately they have, when they're consolidating those reviews, you have to critically go through those reviews and make a decision. Sometimes, well, never heard of this, but sometimes it could be that maybe all the reviewers say yes, but the ultimate decision for you would be that it's, it, it, I mean, you decline that, right? You know, so, but, but that requires you coming up with a set of guidelines, pointers, say if you're an editor, this is your responsibility, this is what we expect you to do or something. Uh, but it's hard, even these major entities here, I mean, we've heard of stories where some spring article has been put down because there's something wrong with it, you know, or because an article was authored by some AI tool or something. We've heard of these things. So uh, I don't know, it's usually quality control. I'm sure maybe you'll find a solution, but uh, it's well, hard. Well, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think for us, <laughs> see, well, our, our setup is we will have to have... Uh, so for, for the yeah. purpose of okay, for the purpose of um, the what we do, yeah. as I mentioned, largely the story of work will lie within uh, the authority. But yeah. um, if we have a special issue or um, the articles are leading, we could invite a guest editor yes. who's an expert in that area. Yeah. And runs as a guest. I think that's also another uh, practice to try and mitigate. Because certainly, if we have a special issue and it's AI yeah. and education, yeah. for example, um, then you would want uh, a guest editor who is well vested in that. Area. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. All right, we're almost done. And then there's a production where you actually publish that once you are happy with it. And usually at this stage, you involve the author, the author, right? Say, we are about to publish. Can you just give us final confirmation that you're okay with this, uh, this version of the document? If you say yes, then uh, done. You publish this. Now, in terms of the requirements, right? The obvious things here when you're getting started is you have to think about hosting requirements here. Where is this going to be hosted? Uh, fortunately for you, you've already told us that uh, you have a server space, but also you are a world resource, a world resource organization. Cloud. Yeah, you can push this to Infratel if you want to, you just have to decide. Uh, the thing to think about is if you have your own servers, is there a guarantee that uh, availability is, uh, is reasonable? If um, you have instances where you have uh, failures or intermittence in terms of accessibility, they may be moved to the cloud or something. But that's fine. Um, and then, obviously, if uh, you don't have expertise in installation, configuration, and administration, like initial setup, you'd have to look for a consultant. Uh, but this is a free available and open source tool, so I imagine, I hope, your IT team can look into this. Um, the initial configuration has to be looked into as well. Reviewer forms, uh, branding, maybe creation of a template specific to HEA. Um, turns out creating a template is quite easy. This could be considered a content management system. It's like, uh, I don't know, the website runs, is it uh, Drupal WordPress, right? Yeah. So that, the thing we look at for HEA, that's a template that's specific to HEA. You do the same thing for OJS. You'd have to define roles. So the people that have been added as users, which ones have been given the reviewer role, editor role, because what they have access to is dependent on the roles as well. Um, and then issues to do with uh, marketing and syndication. Uh, you'd have to plan to figure out which academic databases you're going to be syndicating content to so that people know that you exist, right? And of course, tied to this is the issue of indexing as well. Um, but, but I think, the, so this is the initial requirement of like setting up the zone itself. Um, 
the things you have to do requirements. In terms of the course, there are going to be initial startup course and recurring course. Uh, if you are hiring a consultant to develop this initial installation, configuration, and customization, obviously, we can remove the hosting requirement. Uh, it shouldn't be that expensive. And then for recurring cost here, again, we can remove the first one because you won't have to pay any hosting fees, right? If you decide to go with Xamarin servers or your own servers, no hosting fees here. Uh, we don't have to worry about system administration because IT can oversee this. We've had instances, a lot of instances, I'll give you some examples here where people can't access the site and it's a simple thing as space running out on the server, systems administrator running the, the, the application. Or, or we are, we, we invited the reviewer but they're saying they haven't received an email. The emailing feature is not working. What I was trying to say is uh, if, if it was a different organization, we'd be saying you must hire somebody who's going to administer the system. But if you have IT, uh, and this is within the scope of work, then it yeah. just needs to be expanded. Yes. Yeah. Because it's a one man command. <laughs> like yeah, maybe it's time uh, you got an assistant here. Because uh, if you're setting up the repository and you're setting up this, you notice that it's uh, quite a bit of uh, work. But and then there's the ISSN subscription. It's not that expensive. I think that uniquely identifies your journal. So just there. Yes. Like now where we are, I think we have conceptualized our journal. We have done the concept notes, the you know, thematic areas of focus and this journal management arrangement. Yeah. We do, do what and what and so on. But um, we now thinking about the registration. So maybe yeah. we may say a little bit more. Well, so the only thing to mention here is uh, it depends on how you're going to be uh, publishing this. There are still, uh, I don't know if you know this, but there are still journals that publish both print based mm. and electronic copies of the journal. It turns out that you'd need both if that's the case. An electronic ISSN and uh, okay. a normal one as well. So where do we apply to? Uh, so which entity is that here? Yeah. I say, I say, say, remind myself of where we went to. There we go. Here is okay. where you would go to. And registration. Can't remember how much it cost us, but it's not that expensive actually. Uh, do I remember? Uh, let me just check for. I know Sean uh, through Jobs did this. Um, Um, let me see here if we can I know we we had uh, he had sent us details of uh, of how much money here and I, and I know at some point he became so frustrated he paid this uh, using his own money and then eventually cla claimed the money but um, I wanted. I will check the amount okay. required, and then I can share these details. But it's an online process. It's so we seamless. just go there. Yes, you just and go there and then the process, you request. Yeah. I'm sure you come up with the name of the journal and all those things. Yes, yes, the details yes, of the name. Will yeah. Who agreed this afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the application can be done even before we are online. Yes, it can be done even before. Go. But I think we need it now. Like now, now. Yeah. yeah. So some of the things you can actually do even before you, I don't know how long you'll, you'll be here for, but before you you, you, you leave, maybe on Friday or something, yeah. you make sure that you get some of these things out of the way, or at least plan for when yeah. they're going to be done. Um, more on systems administration. So uh, from, from your experience, how long does it take before feedback is given? You should get feedback within the week, actually. Okay. It's just days. It's just days. It's, process, it's a process that doesn't take long. Uh, because they're, they're just giving you a unique number that's going to identify your mm -hmm. your journal, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> okay. So incidentally, the ISSN is a unique identifier for your journal. In mm -hmm. fact, this is th th these are the things that will appear uh, on your journal, right? Yeah? These things here. The DOI is a unique identifier for 
not just your journal, but it's, it's your online journal, the issue, and the articles in the issues. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other cost, this is a recurring cost as well, the system registration here. Backups, right, very important. In the event that you decide to do these things on your servers, you decide to set it up on your server, you have to think about backups, software upgrades, right, uh, versions change here. Um, and uh, this was supposed to be HEA here or consultant here. So hosting, these are the things I was putting across here. Oh, I, I may have, uh, I'm sorry, I may have, uh, I was thinking about DOIs here. I sent sub subscription or somewhere around here, this much. But this is a once-off, this is a once-off amount, unlike a DOI subscription where I think you have to pay an annual, uh, an annual fee or something. Yeah. And it's based on every article that you're depositing. Um, so the ISSN subscription, is that also a once-off? Um, I think it's a once-off. I could be wrong here. Um, okay. I think it should be. Uh, it should be. Let's so let's try and check. Seven hundred dollars is how much? Fifteen. No, this is a part where we just. Is this uh, why these open access journals that charge us in dollars? Eh? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> I think they, yeah, they okay. have to make profit at the end of the job. I'm sure you look into this, but let's see if uh, GPT can tell us what this is. thing is not yeah we can find out later on uh, I was hoping this thing would, uh, would no. tell us uh, whether this is annual but I so we don't so they did pay for the ISS yes for, for that. I think it was once of it. okay yeah but I know that for DOI for DOI this comes up often because if you don't renew your subscription new things that you're depositing will not be registered so we've not had an issue with ISS numbers, one sort of thing, I think. Uh, and they usually discounts based on which part of the world you, you come from, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to also mention that as we are thinking about this, maybe I, I think HEA is a better place to, to maybe even set up a platform where these other institutions that are interested in setting up journals you can just approach HE, HEA and you create a journal for them, right? If you look at what we are doing in our case, what we are doing is, we are, I, I mentioned that we have this uh, UNSA journal platform, yes? This thing here, that has all the, last time I checked it was, is it 11 or, or so journals? Every time there's a new journal, we just add it here. HEA can do the same thing, right? Where you are hosting, journals for these other higher education institutions that cannot set them up or something. I don't know. Something to think about here, you know, I think. This is the reason I put this up, uh, especially that uh, I think this is one of the things you said, you not necessarily journals, but repositories. Mm. I'm, I'm sure you're headed down the path where yeah. you, you will look into research output a lot more than you do currently. So something to think about. This is what... Uh, uh, Stellenbosch does here, similar to what Unza does anyway. Um, and then just in closing, I just wanted to mention that uh, the whole point of this is we are, we are wanting to, well, for the case of Unza here is uh, rankings, but maybe HEM might be looking at impact, yeah, the yeah. research that is yes, being done. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Very important. Yeah. For, so from the institution's point of view, we are interested in the, the impact of the research. Yeah. From authority point of view, because um, you know we develop standards, yes. we develop policies, yes. guidelines. Now often these are uninformed by yeah. research. Uh, and so what we want this journal, we, we really want it to, to be impactful yes. in the context of informing you know, policy, standards, and practice.
Yes. You know, for, for me, I was very sad this year, um, and I'm not even proud that I was a member of the uh, Education Policy Development Technical Committee, because purely it's guesswork. Hmm. You know, it's not rooted in evidence. It's not the rooted in data. It's not yeah. rooted in evidence, uh, and the expertise is not even there. Yeah. But this report, anyway, has is going to is going to cabinet. It's going to be a national document, so you can actually see the government reaction. Whereas elsewhere, you, it, it will take them a whole year. They're just generating data. Yeah. You know that kind of testing scenarios before they sit down to draft policy. Yeah. In our case, you even sit and start from introduction. <laughs> what do we write? <laughs> so you can see that the, it's impossible for you to have robust uh, policies as a yeah. country. So the, the idea really of the journal is, first of all, it's for each year, but it's also to help the country. Yeah. Uh, largely. Yeah. Wonderful. This is, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts, but this, I hope this was, is useful in helping you get started. Yeah, um, I think yeah, this, this is useful. Maybe just one thing. So yes. we know where to go to register, Michelle, not so. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just the cost, but I think we can have a budget somewhere. Yeah. The logo, logo and face, even for online journals, we make sure that we, we design the face ourselves. Yes, and if you notice now, uh, I have a very no, interesting story about a, <laughs> a very interesting story about. You know that uh, this is actually still going to Senate. Uh, this thing was being discussed by Senate, right? Logos for these journals, three, three journals. This is how important uh, branding is here. So, so yeah, you have to think about the logos here. This is the logo for ja the logo for jobs, apparently. Is a tractor, and people are not too happy that it was a tractor. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is uh, for JLSS. I don't know which one is for. Oh, this is that one. That one is what? This one? This is what? This is uh, the Journal of uh, Lex Lexicography and, and Terminology. Yeah. Just books around. Yeah. This is from all uh, this linguistics, is eh? Yeah, linguistics, yes. Ah, then, then the other one? This one. Is uh, languages and social science education. Ah, this is well, this is the part where you this, go for this, you I decide this would to have in the journal of geography. <laughs> 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 and this is the part where you decide as an interior team to we'll create our own logo, right? Yeah. Instead of hiring um, an expert, a graphics designer to do this on your behalf. But but I do encourage you to think about uh, uh, coming up with. Um, oh, you already have a logo. Right? No, it's for the journal. For the journal, not for each year. We can't use for the institution for each year. No, each year will be there. It will be there, but but what the feature speaks to the journal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure the law may have even yeah. uh, the just the scale or something yeah. like yeah. that. Journal of preventive and education. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> this is one. Do you know what? This one. Oh, the journal of education. Yeah. But let's see, it's, that's what it speaks, books, graduation, but I think it has too many things. Yeah, so we have to think about <laughs> our <laughs> history. Can I tell you something? There's a... Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. can crowdsource this, I mean, put up a, yeah. a competition to say we are, we are in the press or something, we'll pay the best one. There, there are a lot of graphic designers that will jump up. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. This is the one which looks like for history. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 for initiation It's journal for contemporary issues, actually. It's, 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 this is an old journal. It is one of the oldest, actually. It's one of the oldest yes. journals. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know if there are any other thoughts here, but uh, any any questions that we may yeah. have, people will all be playing a role here. Well, that's correct. So Inclu that including we could this man who could host, we could host for money for money. Yes, and registration for hosting is free. We don't need to charge. No, so it's up to you. M my my thinking is, uh, I mean, as an authority, this would be like. Uh, mm -hmm. 
in our voice been a strong advocate. We want to identify entities that will be able to carry on, right, in the event that certain key people are not around, not tying these things to people. Um, so if if you do that, you can easily charge for this service. And I don't think an institution would say no to that. They're providing a service, right? Yeah. Software as a service. Uh, so I was, I was suggesting, I was mainly suggesting this as a fundraising kind of venture or something. And also, because you'd be surprised, there are some high education institutions that are unable to do this because they simply don't have the capacity. For the longest of time, CPU institutional repository has been down. I don't know if they fixed this yet. You know? It was down even during the classification. Yeah. So it's capacity. So you're trying to think about, yeah. do you, can you develop capacity? And that, and that brings out the other thing. Yeah. The, maybe it's not a big issue, but security. Um, security in terms of your your journals are on the edge on the the Unza website. Unza Unza Silver. Unza Silver. Yes. Okay. So we have a bit of control there, but but uh, if you decide to go the cloud route, I mean, if you go to Infratel and Zamrin, it's a guarantee in terms of security there. At the cost, yeah. Well, for Zamrin, it's free anyway. No, you're, no, you're already paying. Yeah, oh, Zamrin is free, yeah. Eh? Because you're already paying money. You pay money, right? Oh, Every yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, we pay them for internet, but they did. Oh, it's just in terms of cost. Yes, if you want servers, they did give us a uh, cost. Uh, yeah. Okay. But this is where IT comes in because you do, mm -hmm. you look at the cost of if you host this on yourself. If you already have servers, that's fine. Um, it's just, I mean, how do you guarantee availability, right? Yeah. Especially that you mentioned that it's, uh, I thought there was somebody else, uh, it's just one person here, it's, uh, you know, he's somewhere else and uh, people can't access the journal. It has happened with the wounds, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's this obsession, no, we must install these things on our own servers. I mean, <laughs> Why can't you go the cloud route? There's infratel. Mm -hmm. They hire dedicated resources that make sure that those things are up and running all the time. Yeah. You know, so, but it's something you can, you can, you can. I'm sure you can compare the cost and the other advantages and yeah. decide on what would be the best. We can do a trial and see how things okay. go. Okay. No, I think co-location would be the cost-effective for us. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, renting servers is quite expensive. Yeah. Whether you are cloud or at infratel, I think the quotations are roughly around the, the same, maybe slightly cheaper. But where you co-locate, you buy a server for yourself, and yes. you sit at infratel, is uh, relatively sustainable mm. as well, depending on how you will be funding yeah. the, the journey. Yeah. You know, what I'm wondering is why we, because in the in the West, you find a boy is running a very robust website <laughs> from his bed. Yeah. yeah. And, um, we, we, are, we are slowly getting there. The, the yeah. entrance has always been uh, dedicated uh, connectivity. No, no, not, the, not the, the, the party, but I'm talking about the, you find the hosting fees are lower, the what, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I always give a quick example. You know, when I was in uh, I used to get a service of uh, the equivalent of DSTV, yes. a landline, and unlimited internet at a cost of only 30 pounds. Everything. Yeah. But when you come here, each of these has to be broken down into its and own. It's slightly more expensive. By the time you want to do something, you look at it, it becomes almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about uh, you know the emergence of uh, AI and yeah. you know this digital drive. I think we we, we are behind. No, yes. yes. at least the AI won't take uh, the jobs that we need. You no, know, I'm not talking about the jobs. I'm like those jobs, like you know, removing the actual cardboard from the ground. No, so <laughs> they still need us for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, there are those who want to go into this digital space yeah. quite because uh, there's 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 money to be made in the yeah. digital space. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll tell you this thing here: a private. You know, you know that there are a lot of private companies now that are running online journals like Inari. Yes, you know, all yes, of those. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, the Indians, the Chinese. 
Yes. In fact, if you look at Zambia, yeah. the major selling point, would, now I know we're not really storing any any personal identifying information, but um, we're getting to a stage where hosting some of these services is going to be increasingly hard outside of the boundaries of Zambia. So, so it forces locals to actually come up with solutions, if you know what I mean. So, so for instance, I'll give you an example of uh, banks, right? Ideally, are not allowed to host data about their clients outside of Zambia. What that means is that either they buy their own servers or they look for a company that is able to do that on their behalf. Infratel, for instance. The Data Protection Act of 2021 is what I'm referring to. You know, so, so yeah, I hope we'll get to that stage. And it makes me wonder sometimes if people like myself who teach some of these courses are really doing uh, a decent job of exposing uh, these students, right? Because they're the ones that are supposed to innovate and come up with this business model. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yes. If we get to a stage where we want this term to be indexed, yes. Uh, so indexing is twofold. There's indexing uh, where you configure the journal so that it's indexed by uh, entities such as uh, ooh, Archive Scholar, right? Uh, what else? Uh, our very own uh, Google Scholar, right? Um, it turns out that this is a there's a feature that is inbuilt. Um, and so once you make those configuration changes, these things will automatically pop up in places like Google Scholar. But there's also a part where you have to explicitly apply to be indexed in these major academic databases. Scopus, if you use this as an example, or the director of open access journals, or Africa Journals Online. For you to get indexed in a director of open access journals, by the way, uh, I should mention here that in South Africa, the list I was talking about that has uh, accredited journals, sometimes it's not specific journals, but academic databases, and the director of open access journals is there because they know that the mechanism they have in place for identifying what needs to be indexed by them is so strict, right? Uh, in that case, you have to make sure that you align with the requirements, like the diversity of your editorial team, like the frequency within which you're publishing. Oh, we're only publishing twice in a year. This year it's one issue. Next year it's two. The following year, no issue at all. They don't want that. So there are all these different things that you have to look at. What you will need to do is, because this is focused to higher education, you want to identify which places you want to index your content. And then look at the requirements that they have. And then try and plan what you're doing relative to those requirements. The first part is not difficult, the configuration part, right? This can be done the moment you, um, you set up your journal mm -hmm. as you are customizing. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Does the index differ from the accreditation? Or it's, is it the same thing? Well, so, a bit of the same thing because accreditation means you're associating yourself with some recognized entity, right? And when you associate yourself with that entity, they'll index, make sure that your content is indexed in the academic database. Like for instance, um, you could say, oh, okay, they're different anyway, because uh, accreditation is tied to, uh, it's like how, I don't want to use the word authentic here, it's tied to affiliation. You're affiliating yourself to something or someone. Right? And someone will only accredit you if you conform to a set of certain a set of certain standards. But when you're affiliated with that something, they will index your content in their portal. You become accredited. In some instances there are certain bodies that you want to be accredited to anyway. Like the Africa yeah. you are saying, they'll do both their accreditation yes. and the index. Yes. Okay, so uh, accreditation is basically a very fluid term. Yeah. It depends on the context in which you use it. So in the South African case, um, you, you know the way the South African, you know, higher education structure, etc., is that um, you have on one hand uh, research funding bodies like the 
in our age. That's the situation. Yeah. But you also have like the Council on Higher Education, which is the equivalent of HEA. And then you have the Department of Higher Education, which is equivalent to our Department of Universal Education. So the way they have set it up, the Department of Higher Education has overall responsibility when it comes to policy and education. Um, and um, so one, one of the things that the department is big on, one is we are very concerned also about the quality of private institutions. So the Department of Higher Education registers private institutions. CHA does not register the private institutions. It's also concerned about the quality of research. So actually it's the Department of Higher Education that accredits the journals in the country. Now what they have done for them is first of all, for the local journals in the country, they have provided they have to apply their own criteria. So they have indexed the local journals. I mean they have accredited the local journals as accredited journals. For those which are external to South Africa, they are using okay, is this index in Scopus? Yeah. Is this index in Wego? Is this the Africa Journal online? Then those have been accredited. So what happens is if you publish outside the accredited journals, then you don't earn a point. To earn points, you have to, and then they have also categorized the journals, yeah. the accredited journals. So if you are publishing in this journal with this impact factor, you earn these points. Then the NRIF, for that publication the accredited journal, will give you a small fund which goes to account. So that's what that's how our friends went. So for us, I think that what we do at one point this came, can each year accredit journals. Yeah. And then we after discussion we said no, we'll ask each institution uh, to have a directory of approved journals where the staff can <coughs> publish. Uh, because we didn't have the capacity. Because what it requires is really a dedicated office. Because you know journals crop up every year. And we are talking about it. national and international journals. Yeah. So some of you who went, for example, to China, you may have published in a Chinese journal. I must be able to pick it up and say, what's the quality of this journal? Can we accredit it for us? So it's really a, a lot of work at national level. Um, and um, we, don't, we don't have the capacity yet. Yeah, I, I know in South Africa, the, what is talking about the list is usually a spreadsheet that is updated almost on an annual basis. Yes, yes. Um, but you notice, if you start syndicating content to the director of Open Access Journal, you'll be accredited by South Africa's DHET, mm -hmm. because on their list, they'll have these things there. There's a South African list, but there are also these entities. Yeah, so that's DHET, that's the department of education. Yes. That does. Yeah. So okay. in this case, the uh, HEA journal will be accredited by yeah. DHET. So the, the, because the big job that they also have yeah. is to separate <laughs> the authentic ones yeah. from the printed journals, which is also a, a, a big key. Yeah. Anyway, I think this has been a very interesting... And I'm very glad you invited me. I and snuck uh, in uh, the things that I've been itching to talk about. Yeah, to acknowledge. <laughs> Maybe we, we need to... Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to mention that there were other conversations that we had, I think, started uh, prior to COVID, and it's unfortunate that uh, yeah. Dr. Shweepa passed on, but I think he remembers we, we had been discussing a couple of things. So I'm glad that uh, hopefully this would be able to set the stage for us to continue those other conversations. Yeah. And some of the things I spoke about. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. No, nope, this is a uh, fine. Uh, we've been doing this since 2018. Oh, yeah. It's always nice when you have other people that are interested yeah. in things you've been doing for a very long time. Yes, yes. We'll <laughs> yeah. call on you. More than happy yeah, to help. We, we, we have a phone call and email away. Yes. Yeah, um, we are inviting you for lunch. Yes, I was, I'm going to have to apologize. I have, uh, I mentioned we are getting to the end of the semester yeah. of assessments, uh, so I have to rush back. Uh, but thank you very much. Yeah, you can carry something back. Yeah, you can carry something back. Oh, yes, thank you very much. I shall yeah, carry yeah, part one. I would want to, to do a test of uh, yeah. Waterfalls uh, yeah. Hotel here to see. Yes, <laughs>
Okay, so guys, we have to now. We are discussing the actual. Yes, I'll have it done. Thank you for business. Yes. Yeah.